I, I spotlighted us Mary pr- prematurely. So now we're okay. like, so now it's like, hi everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Get your game face. Um, just waiting. We have two more minutes. So. I feel like there's an expression to be on time is to be late. I'm gonna. I like being on time. I just like you come in a little, like you come in a minute early. That's 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 all right. <laughs> Sometimes it's a clock thing, but yeah, of course. Sometimes yeah. you're just late. Fair, okay. fair. That's very generous. Thank you, Mary. You're right. But that's it is six thirty by my clock. <laughs> At our school, we go by battery-operated clocks, and they're all different. So we end up with our phones to really know what's going on. Right. Okay, I'm just waiting for two more board members. I'll give it one more minute. We do have a quorum, but It'll just make us go back if we start. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Hi, Roger. It's Linda. Hi, Linda. Hi. Um, I think Claudette let you know that I'm trying to hit another meeting tonight also. Mm-hmm. And who's thing under the committee appointment? Hopefully yeah. I'll be out by 7.15 or so. We'll just wait and see how the meeting goes. Yes, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, try to prior, we'll try to prioritize when we get to that agenda item. But thank you. No, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Claudette, let me okay. know. Thank you, Claudette. Great. Thank you. All right, so I see our other board members. I'll spotlight them, and then I'll we'll start our meeting. Okay. Uh, there's Marsha, and then Rob is here. Okay. Recording in progress. Okay, welcome everyone. It is Wednesday, April thirteenth. Uh, this is a regularly scheduled select board meeting. Um, my name is Roger Arnold. I'm joined by um, Mary Layton, Vice Chair, Claudette Brochu, uh, Marsha Calloway, Rob Gear, uh, and we also have Rod Francis, our town manager, with us. Uh, this is a remote only meeting as allowed by the provisions of Act uh, 78. Um, that means that there's no designated meet- meeting location where the public may attend. Um, votes that are not unanimous may be roll called. Um, We welcome comments for all items on the agenda. Board member discussion will be specifically uh, prioritized. Um, Please try to um, phrase your comments as comments rather than questions. Um, And please direct um, all comments to to me as chair. And I will direct um, someone, another person for follow-up if that is necessary. Okay, so the first item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. We had, uh, we have a request for an addition, it is uh, the approval of expenditures um, for uh, really sort of a retrofitting of our, uh, I, our, our computers, really, and there is supporting information provided to us. The, uh, we've had 
We've been given a heads up in the past about this that was forthcoming, so it seems appropriate to add it to the agenda if board members would like. Um, the only thing I will, um, uh, the, the invoice became available sort of the day after our agenda setting, so it seems, um, so it's, it's our choice if we wanted to wait, but it seems, anyway. That's the context. So that is a suggestion for a change of the agenda. So um, I'll leave it to you all to give me a motion. Go ahead, Mary. Um, I move to approve the agenda as amended. That's great. <laughs> is there a second? OK, um, made by Mary, seconded by Rob. Um, any further discussion? OK, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, great. So we have the approval of our agenda. Um, the next item on the agenda um, is the consent agenda. And so- um, Isn't it when, public comment though? Oh, it's public comments. Thank you for and that. Public comment, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm rushing because I really want to get to our appointments because we have so many faces with us. But nonetheless, it is public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Or are there any members of the public who would like to um, make a comment for an item not on the agenda? You can use your Zoom hand on the bottom of the screen, raise your hand and star nine if you're on the phone. Okay, oh, I see Mary perhaps with a select board comment. Yeah, I just think that um, thinking about how the world has been, we're coming out of COVID, we've got inflation, we've got a, you know, very low unemployment rate. There's a lot going on. And I'm, I'm just hoping that people can feel okay and try to get along and try to pull together just in general. So that's it. Yeah, I, th thanks. That's a, a worthwhile public service announcement. Thank you, Mary. Um, uh, Marsha, I see your hand. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to let the folks know, uh, some people had asked me, about um, the statutes for planning commissions and um, directors of public um, of zoning and, and that sort of thing. And so I have written a memo which went to the board and I suggested that it be looked at by legal counsel and that's happening. So I wanted people to know that. <clears throat> yes, it's, um, it's in their hands. Um, great, go ahead, Claudette. Just as an update for committee appointments, last night's planning commission, I believe they received a resignation mm -hmm. uh, of Leah Romano. So I believe now that there would be four seats. But That's I don't right. know if we can if we can uh, um, adjust tonight to the four seats, or do we need to wait? I think we can discuss a little bit when we get to that agenda item. Um, but but thank you. I was I received word officially from Leah. I was I acknowledged her email and thanked her on behalf of the board and was going to of course announce it to all of you. So but let's let's discuss how we want to handle that when we get to appointments. But thank you, Claudette. Okay. okay. All right. So maybe we can move on to the consent agenda. Is that right? I got that right. Great. Yes. <laughs> All right. So when we, I'll take a, I would love to take a motion for the consent agenda. Um, and uh, go ahead, Mary. <laughs> I move to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. Made by Mary, seconded by Marsha. Okay. Uh, any discussion about correspondence, the warrant, um, or the meeting minutes? Go ahead, Mary. Only that I, I like the correspondence that says it would be great if we if we grew sunflowers all over Vermont in support of Ukraine. And I plan to do so. My mother always has them. I always have them in her garden. But I think by the roadway would be really good. So. Yeah, yeah no, I thought that was interesting. Thank you for acknowledging it. Um, I would like to I. I I feel uh, I would just like to acknowledge uh, John Carroll wrote to the board, reminding us, um, offering some tips, to say the least, about you know how to run effective meetings that um, allow us to do our deliberative work, but also um, have public participation. Um, I 
I'm very mindful of the, if I felt like advice and I'm very mindful of it personally uh, and I'm, I'm thankful for it. So thank you, John Carroll. Um, uh, anything else? Okay. And then, uh, then so then um, uh, all in favor, I'll call the question of uh, approving the consent agenda. Please raise your hand. Okay, excellent. Okay, now for, um, so, so we have our appointments and the motion sheet sort of sets out a, a procedure for, for doing this, right? We'll have, um, it, it says um, how, who is applying and how many seats there are, right? Um, and it takes the names in one single motion. So what I would like to what I would like to do is I would like to hear from the folks who are named in that motion first, and then um, after we hear from them, perhaps we could make a, a motion. Um, I would uh, it would be great because I'm also going to be bringing people onto the screen. Mary, I, I'm sprinting this on you. If you can um, just announce the the name to me, <coughs> the motion, so I can go find them and bring them over to. To our screen so we can can we see them but let's start actually with linda cook and the solid waste committee and then we'll if you can go down the list and give me the names we'll sure that'll be really helpful okay okay linda cook. so um so we'll do the solid waste committee and we have um um an applicant um in linda cook and so the question that I'll ask, um, just stepping back one second, I should say, we ask folks to appear for these appointments. And I know it's a busy time with school vacation week. And so we are really appreciative of people's attendance. Um, we do this um, so we have a chance to, to meet some of you who, if we don't already know, um, to discuss your application, to address any questions, and to also consider sort of the full makeup of you know, of the team, right, of, of that given, that given public body. And so it's both a get to, get to know you and to um, think about, you know, all the skills that we're bringing together. Um, okay, but now that being said, now I'll turn to Linda Cook um, and the Solid Waste Committee. So Linda, I'll ask, um, uh, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your interest in joining this committee? Hi, I'm Linda Cook. I've applied for the Solid Waste Committee. Um, I've been volunteering up there, doing various projects like opening up the woodshed with a, a woodshed, the bookshed, with about eight to ten other people, trying to clean it up, get it reorganized and functioning again. And I think that was our first really working time up there doing to help. And then I've just been there at different times for an hour or so here and there, trying to meet the new people in the community and do a little explaining of the operations that happen up there. So they've got a little bit of an idea and trying to point out the people that work there and who to ask your questions of that they will be able to help you. And just trying to help people with a transition moving into our town and what's available to them. I also was a member of the select board and reviewed the Casella contract and set the ticket fees and also permit sticker fees due to um, revenue versus expenditures and what we needed to cover our costs. So I've been a part of it for quite some time in various aspects. And do you have any questions for me? Uh, I think that's I think that's great that um, that was perfect. Um, you've you're modeled what we're what we'd love to to hear a little bit for everyone who's coming next. And do board members have any questions? Go ahead, um, Mary. I I just have a comment. I appreciate what Linda is saying about um, helping people who are new to town to know what to do at the transfer station because I think it can be a bit bewildering especially if they come from a, an area where recycling is not done. And it, it kind of builds on something that also came out of the child care committee that in other areas, uh, you know, we could find ways to be welcoming to um, new residents. Yes. Thank you, Mary. Um, Rob, did I see your hand? 
you're on mute. <clears throat> okay, there we go. Still muted? Still on mute. Still on mute. Space bar didn't work. So. <laughs> okay. Just wanted to ask Linda, <laughs> how many years has she been uh, uh, a user of the recycling uh, transfer area? <laughs> Because uh, I imagine she started when back when it was a dump. That's correct, Rob. It was a dump at that point. And then it started transitioning to a transfer station where people sorted their trash up there, down little holes at a table, and moving along to what we have today. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure if when I was a child... I went up there very often. That was not a place my parents wanted me to run around. Yes. Oh, yeah. Broken glass. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, I would love to take a motion. We got some bonus transfer station nostalgia, which is, when, which is great, <laughs> too. Um, uh, right. Is there a motion? Go ahead, Mary. I move to appoint Linda Cook to the Solid Waste Committee for a term oh, to be determined. That's right. Okay. By the committee themselves. By the committee, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Is there a second? I. Okay. Rob, I, right? I saw Rob's hand. Okay. So it's made by Mary, seconded by Rob. Any discussion? Further discussion? Go ahead, Marcia. Yeah. Um, that's an odd thing, isn't it? To have the term determined by the committee itself. The why isn't the board doing it? I think it says to be determined. There's no, we can come back and revisit it. Part of the getting their quorum is also students. Like they're, they're, the students have um, voting rights who also make or voting privileges because they're committee members. But I think the nature of the membership makeup invites further discussion on terms. Does that make sense? Which is what we've done. We have made these appointments. Yeah. I guess I'm just getting concerned when the um, we had one appointment who was a student for the Conservation Commission, I think, and the student didn't live in um, Norwich. And I think, you know, to some extent, I think with a student, I'm a little bit less concerned, except that if they have voting rights, I think that that gives voting rights to people who don't live in the town. So I think that the board should be cognizant of making sure that committees are are seeking um board membership and that if they are going to allow students I, I can't imagine a situation where we would want to encourage or allow a person from another town to serve on a committee on our in our town but you know students are sort of special um but i don't know that an out of town student should have voting rights and so to the extent that I, that there's an idea that perhaps the Solid Waste Committee has the prerogative to determine who on their committee can vote, I would object to that. So, so I'll just I'll just say that the committee has a charge. The committee makes clear the the uh, the, the number and uh, the terms, and so and then the motion on the table is you know to be determined. So if we would so in the interest of time particularly because we have other folks with us this evening you know we can we can make it a future agenda item to discuss um discuss that point um because we also want to talk about committees more broadly but the motion itself says to be determined it doesn't necessarily imply it doesn't necessarily explicitly state by by the committee and as i alluded to the membership of the committee is such that it needs to be determined so that's my explanation. I don't know if that helps. Well, I guess I'd feel better if we could have a term for Linda. Okay. Is there, um, is there a friendly amendment you would like to make uh, to the motion? Yeah, if I can know the history, are people generally appointed for a two-year term, a three-year term? Is it, yeah? I'm going to turn to Claudette. So when this committee first started, they had a um, difficult time getting a getting enough applicants to uh, to have a quorum. There is currently a 
three year, and I think that's it's either Jack or uh, Andy Shire Shearer. Mm-hmm. A two year, which is either Jack or Andy. Alex uh, Nordgren was a or Thorngren. Apologies for yeah. mispronouncing his name. Was a one year, and he resigned. And at that time, or right before then, the two students came on. One who was a town resident, and another who is a Hanover um, student. And they were, I believe, both for one year. Um, so, in effect, we could say we could give Linda the one year a one year term. Let's do that. Um, is that can you make can we make that friendly amendment? Yes, um, that friendly amendment is acceptable to me. Okay, so uh, Rob, though, and second, Rob, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. lovely. So then, with that, I'm I'm happy to call the question with the friendly amendment. Okay. okay. All in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Claudette, for for that lift. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank and thank you to Linda. Um, so now. Now we're going to Conservation Commission, Alex Gottlieb and Craig Lane. Okay, thank you, Mary. I'm gonna bring, I saw Craig Lane, here he is. Um, so folks can turn on their cameras. Um, when we announce their names, I can bring them over. I can add a spotlight. So here's Craig, which is great. And then I'm not seeing um, Mr. Gottlieb. Alex is here. Here he is. Here he is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Linda, could you mute, please? I'm going to mute Linda now. Great. Okay. Um, so welcome to Craig and Alex. These are two um, two applicants for two, pos- two open positions. Um, Craig, um, why don't we begin with you? Can you, um, can you uh, <laughs> introduce yourself and tell us why you're interested in continuing, um, continuing on the Conservation Commission? Yeah. Uh, hi. I'm Craig Lane, uh, Tigertown Road. Um, I've been on the commission... Uh, several iterations uh, and lately started several projects that I feel I should continue to help uh, work on. That's great. Thanks, Craig. Um, Do any folks have any uh, questions for Craig? Obviously, we we know his work in in many ways. Go ahead, Claudette. Craig, could you expand on the projects that you want to continue to work on? Uh, Well, primarily, the Woody Adams Conservation Forest. So it's it's town it's town parcels now and conserved, but there's a lot of posting to do and trail work and um, uh, other conservation work to do. Okay, thanks. Any other questions um, for Craig? Go ahead, Marcia. Yeah, question. More of a comment. I mean, sure. over over the time I've been on the board, I've been concerned about longevity on boards and turnover. Um, Craig is a good example of a person that's been extremely valuable. And um, I think we have to be mindful of that sort of value and the kind of projects that you're doing. Um, it, It doesn't mean that I don't think that we should have new blood turning over, but I I'm always torn because certainly there are times when people are doing a lot of things and have a background that really is uh, suitable to help the town. So I I hope you are doing a lot for forests because deforestation is going to uh, impair our help, our work on climate change, and we need to keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you, Marcia. Any other comments or questions with Craig? Otherwise, I'm happy to hear from Alex. Okay. Um, so the, the other applicant for the other open position is Alex uh, Gottlieb. Um, same question. Can you um, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your interest in serving on the Conservation Commission? I believe this is um, would be your first term, right? Um, yeah, that's correct. So yeah, my name's... <coughs> Sorry, my name is Alex Gottlieb. Um, I live out in West Norwich on Beaver Meadow Road, just up the road from Craig. Um, I'm a PhD student at Dartmouth, and my research interests focus on kind of studying the impacts of climate change on ecosystems. So sort of broadly thinking about sort of 
how the world is changing around us um, kind of as a result of anthropogenic activities and what that means for kind of the plant and animal assemblages around us is sort of a big, that is my professional life um, in my training as a scientist. And then also, you know, personally, that's really kind of what I spend a lot of my time thinking about and doing. I'm really very passionate about kind of science outreach and science communication. Um, you know, since I moved out here or about a couple hundred feet up the road from a really active amphibian crossing on nights mm -hmm. a lot like tonight, we'll probably be out there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I spend my time out there and kind of bringing in neighbors, especially a lot of neighbors with young kids. We love going out with our flashlights and reflective gear and kind of, you know, introducing them to spotted salamanders and all of the various species of frogs and kind of teaching about, um, you know, sort of that annual migration cycle that happens every year. And I've done a lot of that in my past too, um, working with a lot of kind of preschool aged kids, introducing them to, you know, sort of some basic environmental science. So, you know, I've sort of since we moved out here in 2019, I feel like we've been kind of engaging with a lot of that in our little community out here in West Norwich. And I'm just really excited about the idea of kind of engaging with the broader Norwich community a little more and bringing some of my kind of experience and expertise to that. And also sort of taking a lot of my training as a scientist and sort of helping, you know, make sure that, you know, and in interacting with kind of town bodies writ large and making sure that we're making kind of, you know, good scientifically informed data-driven decisions, um, you know, based on how rapidly the world is changing around us. So I guess I'll leave it at that. Yes. Wow. Snaps. Snaps for that. Thank you so much, Alex. That was really great. And yeah, you, you've hit on so much of the work of the conservation, I think, because there's, you know, both forest, forestry management, right. And land management so much as there's a, you know, a love of a programmatic output, right. And like connecting, um, with the community and, and doing some education. And, um, uh, and so that's, that's really wonderful. Any questions or comments for, for Alex? Go ahead, Marsha. I'm really delighted to have a person who hasn't had any service yet for town who's interested in doing this, and especially somebody who's um, working in that field, that particular PhD. And um, I, I really hope that there's more outreach among the committees because there's a tension between um, certain aspects of global climate change and how uh, we deal with that, and that even happens among the committees that we have and the work that we do in town. So I think the more science and uh, information that everybody is uh, privy to is going to be helpful. So I'm, I'm hoping that your committee commission is going to be very active and that you're going to be using what you know to help educate more people here. And you're welcome to my backyard, which is a cacophony of little peepers yeah they you know we're we seem to be a couple weeks behind a lot of the rest of town out here so they just started peeping yesterday uh, not, so not, not we're not quite at cacophony level but i'm hoping in the next couple nights i've had them for the week <laughs> all right well um, let me tell you up here nothing's <laughs> happening <laughs> and we have different microclimates <laughs> yeah so i'm at the up in the corner of Stratford, Thetford, Norwich, at about 1,500 feet, and there's nothing happening here yet. Yeah. The bottom right. of the book. Other than some birds. <laughs> I'm going <gonna, laughs> <I'm gonna, laughs> to rain in the I peepers. digress. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, the motion is written as a suite, and so um, I leave it to folks to, to make that motion or to create yeah. another one. Go yeah. ahead, Mary. Okay. Um, I move to a point... Alex Gottlieb and Craig Lane to the Conservation Commission for terms to expire on March 31st, 2026. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, uh, made by Mary, second by Claudette. Rob, how are, do you have any peeper stories or can I call the question? No, I squeal a little bit, but <laughs> other than that, no. Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> all right, um, okay, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Alex and Craig, for, for being here and for, you know, your service. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Uh, next is EC Fiber Governing Board and Alternate, Seat Plus Alternate, Irv Tomai, and Rob Gear. 
Okay, great. Um, uh, Irv, uh, welcome. This is usually a time where we hear a little bit of an EC fiber update, which is exciting, um, but um, could possibly be contained to, to three minutes or so. Um, so I would love to hear that. So um, I would love to hear that and about the work that you've been been doing for that for that board, because um, this is a reappointment as well. And you're on mute. Yes, thank you. Uh, at the 700 foot elevation here on New Boston Road, I think I heard one faint peeper last <laughs> night, but they haven't warmed up yet. <laughs> uh, I've been a Norwich resident since 1975. In 2008, uh, the select board appointed me to represent Norwich on the governing board of EC Fiber. Uh, and EC Fiber has changed its form six years ago with the passage of enabling legislation. We transformed into a municipal telecommunications district. Um, and that is a, a new creation in Vermont law, but as a district, it is itself a municipality. So this is not really a town committee. There are, um, can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. My, uh, uh, something popped up on my screen that seemed to think I needed to select a microphone, so I just will ignore it. <clears throat> there are, uh, 23 um, original member towns in the district, and uh, we added another six um, almost two years ago now. And each town appoints a delegate and one or two alternates. At a meeting of the governing board, every town that has somebody present uh, gets one vote, regardless of population. And our membership ranges from tiny towns like Hancock and uh, Rochester up to um, Hartford is our largest member town. Um, we are unusual in a couple of ways, and one of them is that we're not supported from residential taxes of any kind. So that puts us in an odd situation, a good one. Um, and at this point, across our 23 member towns, we have 7,100 plus people connected to full strength broadband, uh, broadband better than you can get in some in the suburbs of some major cities. Uh, but we have a lot more to do. And here in Norwich, we have a peculiar situation. There are folks that have been wanting to be connected for quite a long time and their neighbors are already connected. And people ask why? Well, when we first started building uh, several years ago, we were doing it on a shoestring. And some compromises were made, such as not providing enough capacity for the growth that we've seen. And, and it takes time to add that capacity. That's been going on. Um, we are hopeful that this month or next, we'll at last be able to connect everybody in Norwich. Um, we made way back. And now that there's a lot of federal money coming through, um, are able to speak up and say, let's not make that mistake again with a lot more money. And that is one of the roles that I feel I play as a member of the governing board, of its executive committee, and its um, uh, government relations officer. I have some responsibility for testifying to legislative committees and to the Vermont Community Broadband Board, which was created by last year's legislation. Um, and my testimony helped avoid some mistakes in that legislation too. Um, and which is responsible for distributing construction grants based on that federal money to complete not only EC Fibers territory, but all across the state where several more communication union districts have been formed uh, to try to create uh, to provide rural access everywhere of full strength. 
Um, I don't. I hope I was within three minutes, and I'll pause. <laughs> uh, not quite, but we've benefited nonetheless from 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 the the more minutes. So thank you so much, Irv. Um, do any folks have questions for uh, about the EC Fiber Governing bur Board, the structure? This is sort of our yearly update, as uh, much as it's an appointment. Um, go ahead, Marsha. But yeah, I'm just wondering in terms of the federal monies that are coming through for the municipality, um, is there a difference in the amount of monies per town or is it all the same because you have one vote per town or is, is there some accommodation because some towns are more populated than others and the need is maybe different town to town? I'm not sure I understand the question. The federal money is directed toward building new infrastructure. We actually aren't able to apply that money to build more here in Norwich or Woodstock or even Hartford, but we will be able to build out in the new member towns. And ultimately that will help us to release, to reduce the, our cost per customer and reduce rates uh, across the whole territory. We do not separate individual towns that's the whole point of being right. a unified district all right let me get out of here okay i i think that 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 was helpful i think uh, and i think that addressed a little the majority yeah of yeah i just wanted to know if north is yeah. getting a different amount of money for infrastructure than other places but you answered well the, the amount of money the infrastructure money is a different program and norwich does get some infrastructure money based on its population but we have not asked you to put some of that money toward EC Fiber because we're well aware that the town has several other pressing infrastructure needs. The only area in which we might think of asking you to think about it would be um, conduit to connect businesses and mobile homes to our network. Um, but we, we really aren't about to ask you for that, that we would it's a possibility if you think we ought to think about that, talk to you about it, we will happily propose it, but it's not on our priority wish list at this okay. time. And thank, and thank you, uh, uh, Marsha and Irv, you've sort of previewed the next agenda item in many ways. So uh, this this is also a suite, right? Rob Gear is, is, our, uh, is an alternate, right? So Rob, um, can you just uh, sort of uh, quickly sort of speak about what how your role is sort of... Uh, as an alternate, what that looks like uh, uh, for. Can you tell us a little bit about what an alternate sure. position does and how it works with Irv? Yeah, it, essentially my role as an or, uh, alternate is uh, to step in if Irv gets hit by a bus. And uh, so what I do in order to, to feel confident in that role is I've attended all the meetings, uh, I've kept abreast of all the uh, issues that face the uh, uh, governing board that face EC Fiber and try and keep in touch with, uh, keep aware of what Irv's positions have been, which are usually quite uh, uh, quite well thought out. Uh, the, the one thing uh, in relationship to the last discussion, EC Fiber gets grants from the state, from the federal government as an entity in its whole existence. So it's not related to individual towns. The infrastructure money he was talking about is money that comes directly to Norwich, but which could be used on uh, uh, internet access. All right. So, Irv, I, anyways, that's it. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Rob, for that. And I see Irv has his hand up, but I want to actually take a motion for this suite, and then maybe well, in discussion. I, I maybe in discussion. To, it, I just want to recognize our the other, other alternate. alternate, Joshua okay. Bohar, who is yes. present, uh, but has not applied for reappointment. And um, you might want to give him a moment to explain why he, he didn't. Okay. 
Um, so let's do that. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Irv. Um, hi, Joshua. How are you? And I did, I just recently was looking at your, um, the EC Fiber Minutes for reasons I don't know. And I saw that all of you were in attendance always. And that's pretty amazing. So, and, and thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, yeah, I, I was going to say I very much enjoyed the position and, and uh, representing the town of Norwich as an alternate. Um, and for my position has changed for work, which kind of be, creates a conflict of interest. So I will not be reapplying this year. Um, but I did want to, um, I guess I wanted to elaborate on uh, kind of the idea of term limits on it because I, I, I feel there's a level of specialty um, in this type of position for Norwich to uh, allow members uh, like Irv um, and uh, they have been on it for a while, they kind of have a level of, of uh, ability and understanding that uh, it's kind of difficult to jump into. I work in the industry and there's a tremendous amount I, I learned in this position over the last year. Uh, so again, thankful for it. Um, unfortunately, I just cannot reapply due to uh, you know a conflict of interest with my current employer. Yeah. Uh, yes. But nonetheless, thank you so much for for your service, and thank you, Irv, for pointing out that Josh was here with us. Um, Marsha, quick question: We really do sort of need to work our way through these appointments. Just a commendation, Joshua. Thank you for recognizing a conflict of interest and and putting it out there. Thank you very much, and thank you for your service. Thank you. Okay. Um, that's yes. Um, Mary, are you ready for that motion? Yes, I am. Let's see. I move to appoint. Irv Tomai as representative and Robert Gear as alternate representative to the EC Fiber Governing Board for terms to expire on April 30th, 2023. Okay, is there a second? Okay, made by Mary, seconded by Claudette. Um, I'm gonna call the question. Um, all in favor, um, please raise your hand. I have to recuse myself, I think. Okay, so we will say, see, so we'll say 401 in abstention. Okay. Um, with, thanks to, with thanks to our EC Fiber folks. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Next uh, appointment is for Developmental Review Board, uh, Don McCabe. Okay. Um, welcome, welcome, Don. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your reapplication to the DRB and, and introduce yourself to us. Okay, John, we yeah, know hi, John McKay, Meeting House Road. Uh, I've been on the Development Review Board uh, since about the last Ice Age, and I really enjoyed serving uh, under a uh, changing board over time. I've been, uh, along with my family residents, for, what, 36 years. And uh, development has changed a great deal, as you know, and the uh, regulations have become more complex. But Arlene Rotman as chair, and of course, Rod as the zoning administrator have done a masterful job of bringing the issues to us. We discuss them, we uh, form a consensus, and very often it's a, a very clear consensus on how to uh, rule. And so I enjoy the work and I hope to do more of it. That's great. Thanks so much, John. Um, any questions? Uh, I would love to take a motion uh, then. <laughs> okay. I move to appoint Don McCabe to the Development uh, Review Board for a term to expire on April 30th, 2025. Okay. Uh, that's lovely. Seconded by Rob. So made by Mary, seconded by Rob. Any discussion? Uh, just to say, we're, we're really thankful for your service and um, your and your continued work on the DRB. Thank you all. All right, all in favor, uh, please raise your hand. Okay, great. Thanks, Don. What's next, Mary? Okay, the next is the Energy Committee, two seats, uh, Charles Lindner and Brad Weibel. Okay, I see them here. And so, uh, great. So this is two, two appointments for two seats. Uh, Charlie uh, Lindner is a re, uh, re appointment, and we have a new, uh, a new appointment in, in Brad. So why don't we begin with um, Brad? Um, same question. Introduce yourself and tell us about your interest in the position. How's that? 
Yeah, you know, great. Um, <clears throat> can you hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for the opportunity. Um, my name is Brad Weibel. Uh, I live out uh, toward Union Village Dam on Kerwin Hill Road. Um, I'm new to town within the past year, uh, but um, looking for an opportunity to meet people and to help the community. And so um, my neighbor, Linda Gray, <laughs> who knows a thing or two about this, uh, I, I talk to her a lot about um, energy and opportunities in the community. And, you know, she encouraged me to... Um, apply. So uh, as a homeowner and just a citizen, informed citizen, you know, as we heard earlier, climate change is happening and uh, energy efficiency and, and you know, renewable energy is one of the key things that we can do to address that. So as just a citizen, as a parent, as a grandparent, <laughs> not, not, excuse me, as, not, a, not as a grandparent, that's right. I'm, I'm, <laughs> in, I'm inclined to do whatever I can to help these things. Uh, as, and then in my, my professional life, I spend a lot of time thinking about science, technology, and public policy, and a lot of that gets into the climate and energy space. And so I have a, I'm not shy about geeking out about these kinds of issues in a technical and policy wonky kind of way. And so um, anything I can do to sort of roll up my sleeves and help translate that wonkiness into on the ground change in the community, I'm really eager to try to do. So I'll stop rambling. Thanks. No, that, that was awesome. Thank you so much, um, Brad. Um, any folks have any questions for, for our Brad, which is, this is a new appointment. Yeah. Uh, Marsha has her question. Just a comment. I'm really pleased when people move to town and are interested in joining things. So welcome and um, good luck. Please keep the science <laughs> in front of us all because I'm really worried about conflicts. Yeah, you and me both. <laughs> Yes. Thanks. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, so then, th thanks, uh, Brad. We'll now turn to to Charlie, uh, Charlie Linder, as a reappointment. Charlie, same question. Um, tell us a little bit about your your work, what you look to continue to to do, and anything about yourself. Sure. Um, I live on Hawk Pine Road. Uh, I've been on the committee for three years. Uh, volunteered with it for a year before that to get to know what the work right. was and i kind of uh do whatever is needed on different basis and we used to be able to do a lot of face-to-face -face conversations with people in the community uh at uh, the transfer station and at dan and Wits and various kinds of places It'd be nice to get back to that but so i've been doing a lot on the listserv uh then I've got a project of encouraging people to have a, a home action plan uh, mm -hmm. to look at all the different kinds of infrastructure in our homes that we find that we need to replace and to plan ahead and to learn about new technologies rather than be at the point of, I need a new boiler, but uh, I don't know that much about heat pumps, so I think I'll keep burning fossil fuel. Uh, so that's the latest project I've been working on is, and there've been weekly posts that you may be getting tired of <laughs> about different kinds of things from electric vehicles to electric lawnmowers. So, yeah. And, uh, we have a lot of people who've been, uh, the, the thing that's most satisfying are the conversations with people who respond and say, uh, how do I learn more about this? We have a neighborhood network and I'm part of that. And uh, it's always satisfying to talk to people about what they're trying to do and what's realistic and uh, what the next steps can be that you can do, whether it's a clothesline instead of your dryer. So, uh, and I have two grandchildren who you may hear in the background. I'm at my daughter's house and uh, I'm not happy about what lies ahead for them. And that's why I do this work. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Charlie. Um, this is, yes, another committee that is really prolific in their programmatic output. Um, and thank you for being a part of that. And um, and welcome, Brad. Um, any other, I, I would love to take, how about we take a motion and then maybe we can further the discussion if we need to. Okay. I move to appoint Charles Lindner and Brad Weibel to the Energy Committee for terms to expire on March 31st, 2025. Okay. Is there a second? Okay, um, made by uh, made by Mary, seconded by Rob. Any other discussions or comments for these for these folks? All right, 
with thanks to your service, I'll call the question. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. All right, lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. for being here. Okay, the okay. Ne next uh, is the Historic Preservation Commission. Okay. Uh, Philip Say. Okay, here. Okay. Uh, hi, Philip, welcome. Um, we're asking folks to uh, introduce themselves and just uh, tell us about their interest in serving on, in this case, the Historic Preservation Commission. Sure. Um, well, I'm Phil Zay. Uh, we live at 65 Maple Hill Road. Um, I've been on the Historic Preservation Commission for one term. Uh, I'm the vice chair following along after Nancy Osgood. And uh, we've had several projects uh, in the works, most recently a barn survey uh, of important structures in town that uh, do a lot to maintain the character of Norwich, um, but also to reinforce tourism and, and education. Uh, there was a program that uh, was well received a week or so ago that maybe some of you saw. Uh, as for myself, I've been uh, a professional in historic preservation since the 1970s, um, working in museums and other nonprofits in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Virginia. Uh, and I retired about a year ago, and so now there's uh, what maybe I should have been doing more of all along, and that <laughs> is uh, turning to my roots here in Norwich and contributing what I can to uh, make Norwich a, uh, a better, more vital community. So there I am. That's great. Thanks so much. Um, do folks have any questions uh, for Phil? Go ahead, Marcia. Phil, I'm just glad that you're back and you're involved and I can't think of a more qualified person to do this work. We need a lot of work and I hope that you're extremely active. Thank you. Appreciate it, Marcia. Thanks. Yes, folks are nodding and smiling to that. So uh, indeed. Um, all right. So um, I'll take a motion if that's okay. Okay. I move to appoint Philip Say to the Historic Preservation Commission for a term to expire on April 30th, 2025. Okay. Is there a second? Mm -hmm. okay. Made by Mary, seconded by Marcia. Um, anything else? All right. With, with thanks for your interest and your service, um, I'll call the question. All in favor? Okay. Thanks so much, Phil. Great. Appreciate, appreciate it. Take care, appreciate everybody. It. Yeah. Take care. Um, next is the Planning Commission. So, uh, yeah. Coda had the issue of there are now four open seats. So perhaps we should talk about that. Yes. Yeah, so a couple. So a couple of notes. So yes. So now with um, Leah Romano's um, uh, resignation, we have four applicants for four four seats. Um, and then the only thing I'll say too is Vince Crow, who's an applicant who couldn't be here. Um, with us because it's school vacation week, um, did send, I asked him the same question that I've been asking all evening and he recorded a video. So I'll, I'll be putting that, I'll be sharing that with us. And so th these are the two technical things that we just, uh, FYI. So I guess let's, op what would we like to do in, in with this? We have four willing applicants and we have four now open positions. Um, what would we like to do? Uh, Claudia and then Marcia. Do we know when Leah's term was going to expire? Yes, I if if I'll take Marcia's question or comment and then I'll go look that up. How's that? <laughs> I, I can um, speak to that. I can speak okay. to that, Roger. This is okay, Jackie. Sure. Just Hi, Jackie. Hi. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> good evening. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Leah's term was due next April. Okay. Yep. So this would be uh, sort of one more year to finish out the, Correct. the term, and then they would, um, this person would um, re re reapply. So that is, that is, you know, something to consider. One one Correct. of these applicants would be uh, an appointment in a seat that has to expire, that will expire in a year. It's not a full term. So that would be 
Will you call it April 30th, 2023? Yes. Yes. Okay. Just because it could be set up, um, one would be that date and the others would be the uh, date that's listed on the motion, which would be April 30th, 2026. Yes. Yeah. So one, so what I would recommend then assuming, and I don't know if this is the case, assuming we're willing to hear to, to hear from all four applicants for the four vacancies, we should consider separate motions, um, uh, right. separate motions to make, to make the appointments one by one. Right. That's what I would recommend in this case. Why? Um, because you're, because otherwise you're taking three as a suite and then sort of one sort of separate. And I think you could just take, consider the applicant for what individually for the seat. That's just like one way to think about it. Okay. Well, it's up to you. It's up to the board. That's a question, but Marsha, you had your hand up. And so I want to get to you. Thank you. Um, I think that that sort of thing happened in Ernie Chicatelli's first term. He can tell us, um, but I think that it's more efficient to do the replacement now and uh, make it to just the end of the term of the person that's expiring mm -hmm. and maybe just efficiently do two motions, one for that particular seat and one motion for the other three seats. I okay. agree. Okay, that's fine. Um, Rob? Would it make sense to find out if any of the applicants is interested in a one-year uh, term rather than uh, because I think everybody was presuming uh, the longer term? Good point. Any other, do board members have thoughts on that? I mean, I do think Leah herself, Leah herself came in, right, and, and completed a term and then was appointed for a full term and then now is ironically <laughs> um, stepping off. So, so you know, it's not necessarily, you know, I think that year appointment term is not necessarily, um, I think even our, our current chair was, you know, stepped in to, as a, as a replacing someone else's term. So it's not like, you know, it's a, uh, it's not like you don't have a future life in the planning commission or any other commission if you're feeling, finishing out a term, right? I'll say that. And they're rewriting the zoning. So um, I think we don't want too much. Um, I think we do want some continuity. I, I, would, I would say that to all of our applicants. That, you yes, know. that makes sense. I'd like to hear from the applicants. Okay. So, so we're, we're fine sort of taking two different motions and I will hear from all of you as to how those names will be decided for these motions. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Okay. So thank you, Mary. Let's, um, so can you announce the name for me? The first name on the list or the names? Well, uh, the, uh, the names are Vince Crow, Ernie Sicatelli, uh, Mark Aquila, I think I pronounced that correctly, and mm -hmm. Brian Loeb. Okay, so we have let's listen to these three folks, and then I, I have Vince. Uh, I have Vince on a recorded video. Okay, so um, uh, Ernie, with uh, Ernie, why don't you um, uh, speak to your application and your work on the planning commission? This is a reappointment. Okay, um, can you hear me? Because I'm my com computer. All right, good. It's telling me to unmute myself. Um, I've completed, I think, about four years as a uh, planning commission member. Um, prior to that, I'd been on the uh, DRB since it was founded, um, uh, since the very first uh, meeting uh, for about 15 years. Um, and now we're working on the um, land use regulations, um, uh, renovating them and uh, renewing them. And uh, I think that, um, that that's exactly what I wanted to be involved with when I joined the Planning Commission, um, because after uh, 15 years of wrestling with um, the regulations uh, that we had uh, on the DRB, um, I felt that um, they needed to be a bit clearer, a bit easier to implement. Uh, and so on. And those are what I've been sort of keeping my eye on in, in, in the uh, uh, drafting of the regulations. 
uh, which we've already started and we're well, uh, well underway. Um, I want to just say that, you know, um, this is the, this for me is also the kind of work, a committee work that I enjoy doing. Um, I wanted to be involved in the drafting of the regulations and I got my hands way up into my elbows doing that. Um, and I, it's, it's something I enjoy the, the challenge of trying to make, you know, language clear, make, make the, uh, the uh, the regulations fair and 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 understandable by both the applicants and the uh, um, and the town the the town committees that have to implement the, the DRB. Um, and I think that I've got a, a unique combination of skills um, uh, that that make it so that I'm suitable for this particular work. Um, I also happen to go on to the what's what sometimes referred to as the most prominent uh, environmental law school, and I studied environmental law while I was there, among other things. Um, so I think that uh, you know I'm well suited for the position, and as I said, I enjoy it. Um, I you know I, I I like the people that I'm working with. Um, I don't know really. I, I think it was like the perfect uh, perfect. Um, commission for me appointment to be put on so i'm okay. i'm really happy with it great uh thanks so much ernie um we'll hear from other other folks next but thank you so much uh, do anyone uh any well let's take questions uh after we hear from everyone how's that sound um mark um mark you're gonna have to tell us how you pronounce your last name so we don't keep messing it up and then um but same question uh, introduce yourself and speak to your application <laughs> sure sure thing uh no problem thank you guys for taking the time uh so my name is mark aquila um oh, okay. people will say it many many different ways and that's okay uh, <laughs> so mark aquila um uh, my wife and I have lived in Norwich uh, for the past 10 years. Uh, we have two kids at Marion Cross in first and third grade. Um, we own our own home. Uh, we've also built a home uh, in Norwich. And so we're landlords uh, for the past five years. On the zoning side, we live in the rural residential uh, district. Um, so most of our land uh, is in use with a, with a forestry plan. Uh, we raise bees, chickens, and pigs at home. Uh, we live just a bit past Irv. So the first peeper uh, woke up last night. <laughs> and was, was peeping away till around uh, 10 p.m. Just keep the peeper update going. Um, <laughs> professionally, I've, I've spent about 17 years working at uh, three different companies that are each you know, 200 years old. So I know how important it is to try to innovate and get things done uh, while also honoring just the traditions uh, that have happened before and, and what has come before you. And I, I, that's really difficult. Um, but I've, I've spent a lot of time working in those environments. So um, I'm interested in the planning commission because I like to contribute to like the wastewater, the zoning, and the affordable housing. Those are those are three things that I care about, and I think those three are on the agenda uh, for the next little bit. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I'm also happy to be considered for the for the one year term. I don't. I'm trying to get involved. I don't have a strong preference. So if that's easy for you guys, take it away. That, that, I imagine that does that is helpful. And thanks so much for for being here. Uh, and your interest, you. uh, and well, probably people may have questions for you. Um, uh, Brian Loeb, um, uh, hello, welcome. Hi, thanks, Roger, and thanks to everyone else. Uh, so my name is Brian Loeb. Uh, like Ernie, I'm completing my first term. I'm the current vice chair. Uh, I'd say the the two proudest things of uh, my service so far are the town plan process and my service on the child care committee. I'd say both, uh, both of those areas let me ask lots of questions to people who knew more than me and uh, let me learn so much uh, and then uh, share it in a way that I hope uh, could be helpful uh, for, the, for the various processes. Um, I think that's what's great about the Planning Commission is uh, even if you have a subject matter expertise in one little pocket of what we do, uh, there's just so much else to learn and so many... Uh, so many, so much of the role is bringing other voices to the table in uh, in the areas where you're not the expert, and and so that's what I've enjoyed so much. Uh, in my professional capacity, um, I do regulatory analysis and policy development for affordable housing. So uh, just like Ernie, I'm really excited about the the land use and zoning work we're doing now, and and the process is really cooking, uh, thanks to Jackie's. Uh, leadership and, and Rod's management of the process. 
Um, it's exactly what I, um, my little pocket of expertise is suited for here. And that's understanding how the rules on paper uh, turn into incentives uh, for development. And so I'm looking forward to continuing that process, uh, understanding how uh, the rules that we write can shape the future of the town in a way that supports uh, sustainability uh, and access and affordability. So um, I'd be honored to continue uh, on the planning commission. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity tonight. Thanks, Roger. Uh, thanks so much, Brian. Um, all right, so now um, I'm going to try to get Vince Crow as recorded on his iPhone up for us. So let me just um, get that. Um, okay. There he is. Let me share my screen. Um, uh, okay. I think you'll see that I watch YouTube for a lot of acceptance speeches because they make me feel better. So you'll be seeing that as I um, as I share my screen, um, the algorithms. All right. So here's YouTube. Um, here is Vince Crow. Hi, my name is Vincent Crow, and I am applying for a seat on the Planning Commission. Uh, first off, I want to thank Roger for uh, helping facilitate this uh, delayed video call. Um, unfortunately, my schedule didn't work out with being there tonight, so I'm glad that we were able to make something work. Um, so first off, a little bit about myself. Uh, we moved to Norwich about five years ago. Uh, I have two young kids, both of them go to Marion Cross, and I worked as a mechanical engineer uh, till about the time that we moved to town. At that time, I was a stay-at-home parent, and then now I uh, am a substitute teacher at Marion Cross. Um, I first started getting involved with um, some issues of the town by being part of a group of uh, residents who support the Beaver Meadow sidewalk and kind of got, got a glimpse into uh, the inner workings of the town and just everything that could, that could be kind of involved in that. Um, and I'm eager to help out solve uh, some of the issues moving forward with town while uh, still keeping its history and other aspects in mind um, that were the reason that uh, I decided to move to town in the first place. Uh, thank you for your time and hope to meet you in person soon. Thanks. Bye. Okay. I think that worked. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, okay. Welcome so we. one and all to the late uh, show. Hold I'm on. Stephen YouTube's still going. <laughs> okay. Uh, so Stephen Colbert was talking about Vladimir Putin. Okay, but now we're back. Um, all right, so uh, so we heard from our four uh, candidates for four seats. Um, and do anyone have any questions for our for our for these for these guys? <laughs> Go ahead, Marsha. I, I, I have a general question for everybody. Um, is planning synonymous with development? Okay. Um, who who would let who would like to answer that? Go ahead, uh, Marnie. Is she muted? You're a mute. Oh my gosh! Three years in, folks. Come on, you're uh, unmute yourself. <laughs> the answer, in my mind, is no. Um, it ha has to be considered. I mean, it's part of it, but so is keeping in mind, and, and it's right in the Vermont statutes, things like, you know, keeping the forest blocks, um, um, you know, as whole as possible, considering which, and, and in part, it's, it, that's even specified as being part of a climate change um, combating uh, issue. Uh, you know, there's, there's a, a, there are the demographic issues, there's, um, you know, making what the, how the town is going to feel to people, um and a lot uh, there's a, it, planning is got to do it with i think um how you live it's it's got to do with the, not just a hu the, the natural environment but the human environment the social environment it it's it pulls together just about every 
I don't know, social and scientific discipline there is really to do it right. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Ernie. Um, Brian, would you like to answer that? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question, uh, Marsha. I think it's a good one. Um, if, if you take a look at the town plan, uh, one thing really stands out and that's uh, that it's not that uh, planning is synonymous with development. It's that development is happening, whether planning is happening or not. Um, mm -hmm. And over the last mm -hmm. few decades, the town has become more unequal. Most development has happened in Ernie's forest blocks farther away from town. There has been development, but it's not been conscious, sustainable, strategic. So when we think of planning and the work that we're doing on the planning commission, it's uh, using our shared values to shape that development at the scale that makes sense for the community. Um, it's not in favor of or against development. It's about bringing our values to the development that's occurring. Okay, lovely. Um, Mark, uh, if you would like to, you can answer this one question. Sure, thanks, Ryder. Uh, thanks, Marsha. I, I don't think planning is the same word as, as development. I also think that if you don't have a plan, you get what you get and you don't get upset, which I tell my daughter um, quite a bit. So I, I think that to some extent, you've got to have a plan and you've got to know what you want to do. And development can fit in that plan. I, I think around the world, population's increasing. We know there's growth. Without a plan, I would say we're in trouble. And that goes not just for our board, but for energy and for everything else that we, we've heard from today. Okay, that's great. Um, in the interest of time, I would really um, uh, like to move us along. And so we have two motions for for this committee, right? So we have one motion that would be a one-year uh, seat um, ending next year, and then um, three seats for the term that is defined on the motion sheet. So um, I'm happy to take motions. Go ahead, Mary. I move to appoint Mark Aquila uh, to a term on the Planning Commission to expire April 30th, 2023. Okay, is there a second? Okay, second. made by Mary, seconded by Rob. Um, any further discussion? Thanks for, thanks for helping us out with this decision, Mark. Um, uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you, lovely. And the second motion I move to appoint Vince Crow, Ernie Sicatelli, and Brian Loeb to the Planning Commission for terms to expire on April 30th, 2026. There's a second. Okay, me and my Mary, second by Claudette. Um, any further discussion? Go ahead, Marcia. I liked those um, explanations and I hope you keep to them. Yes, and 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 thank you. There's a lot of work to do. Um, like there, if if you've watched a recent meeting, you know that folks are really sort of digging into the zoning rewrites. So um, uh, thank you for 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 your service at this unique time, okay. right? Um, so all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. All thank right, you. thanks. And so we have two Bye. committees. Thank you. So, Let's let's go ahead, Marsha. Yeah, I wanted to thank you, Roger, for arranging the Vincent Crow um, presentation because I think it's really important that everybody is is here for talking about why they want to be on a committee. So thank you for doing that. Yes, and and thanks to and thanks to the folks who are parents who are, have made time um, to be here um, and it, you know as well. So. I, I know it's school vacation week. So is rec council next in the interest of, you know, getting a, getting yes. a parent out of here. Okay. Yes, rec, rec council, um, Marisa Lorenzo. Okay. Hi. Um, thanks so much for having me. And thank, it's really wonderful to see so many community members and neighbors sort of volunteer to do things. So it's, it's exciting to be a part of. Um, so we've moved to Norwich about four years ago. Um, I have two kids. We live on, Craig Hill Road, and sort of as part of getting to know the community, we've been involved in a lot of the RAC programming. 
both for kids and adults and, and really sort of value the sense of community that those programs bring sort of through, I mean, Halloween and sports and things like that. So really love the, the fact that it runs the gamut. Um, and so I'd love to get back by sitting on the Rec Council Committee and sort of furthering that sense of community. That's great. Thanks so much, Marissa. Any questions or comments? Go ahead, Marcia. Good to see you um, volunteering, Marissa. I'm sorry. Oh, thanks. Glad, thanks. I'm very glad to see you volunteering. Thanks. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so right, and so obviously, you know, we we know. Um, Marissa a little bit from her work on the screening committee. So um, we're, yes, we're really glad to see you again to, to help and serve your town. Um, okay, so I'll just call the question um, uh, or can I take a motion rather? Make a motion, yes, yes. They, everyone's so helpful. Yes, take a motion, please. <laughs> um, I move to appoint Marissa Lorenzo to the Recreation Council for a term to expire on March 31st, 2025. Okay, is there a second? Okay, made by Mary, seconded by Marsha. Now I'll say um, all in favor, please raise your hand. All right, thanks so much. Thanks for making the time. Okay, so now we're on to Tree Warden, Thad Goodwin. Okay, um, I will uh, I will take the motion. I don't see Tad here, but I will say that he's been our Tree Warden for several years now. Um, um, so I will say that I don't see him here, right? Um, but there was an application in the packet, so it's up to the board if we would like to entertain a motion. Well, I'd like to make a motion. So okay, I'll just go ahead. Um, I move to appoint Thad Goodwin as tree warden for a term to expire on March thirty first, twenty twenty three. Okay, is there a second? Okay, made by Mary, seconded by Claudette. Any further discussion? Go ahead, Mary. I think that has been a very effective tree warden, and I'm happy that he has stepped up again. Yes, thank you, Mary. Um, uh, I'm happy to call the question. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Thad. Um, now are we on the TROC? Yes, we are. Okay. And I think... <laughs> Yeah. Okay. One seat plus alternate, uh, Jeff Lubell and um, Jacqueline Allen as okay. alternate. And then this is the final committee. Is that right? I think uh, so. I don't know. I think it is. Everyone's nodding. <laughs> okay. Appointment. Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. So um, this is a representative to our regional planning commission. Jeff Lubell was the alternate. Uh, Rod um, was sort of the the designee. It makes good sense um, that uh, we're um, we have a new appointee, and we're so glad that Jeff Lubell has stepped up. Um, so, can you please just introduce yourself, uh, Jeff, um, and tell us a little bit more about the work that you've been doing as alternate and, and how what you'll continue? And of course, thank you for your years on the Planning Commission. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so, I'm Jeff Lubell. I live on uh, Spring Pond Road. Uh, I am uh, cycling off of the Planning Commission, um, and uh, I have for the last three years been an alternate uh, to the TROC backing up Rod. Um, that has largely been a backup role. I've attended when he's not available. Um, and uh, now that I'm no longer on the planning commission, I uh, uh, would be interested in serving as the, as the full-time representative. I, um, you know, my work, my daytime job, I'm the director of housing and community initiatives for a mission-driven research and consulting firm. So I do a lot of work on housing and community development policy. Uh -huh. And um, so I, I, I know something about this topic and something about the role that regional uh, uh, planning plays in really trying to you know, ensure that the needs of all of the municipalities and all the citizens are met. Um, I have, uh, I was engaged uh, to some extent in the Keys to the Valley uh, initiative that was a regional initiative. And I've been in ongoing conversations with them about how they can kind of focus their recommendations and really try to be impactful and I'm would be happy to uh, continue to be of assistance to the Regional Planning Commission in that regard and I'm really just interested there's going to be a lot of resources flowing through from the federal government to the state 
Mm -hmm. uh, and TROC is going to play a really important role. You see Sarah here uh, helping us understand uh, and translate, uh, you know, that uh, state money uh, down to the, you know, locality. And I think I can play an important role in really gathering information there and bringing it back uh, uh, to share with, initially with the Planning Commission and, and with others about, about those resources and how we could um, really uh, tap into them to benefit our, our town. That's great. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, and then Jackie is uh, uh, here for the alternate. So when, you know, Jeff indicates that, you know, he is not available would, would be her role. <laughs> so Jackie, do you want to just speak a little sure. bit to that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I think I'm in Jackie Allen, uh, Union Village Road. Um, uh, I think I've been in town eight years and I've been on the planning uh, commission now for this is my sixth year, and um, I think Jeff is in a great position to take over um, as our Two Rivers representative, and I just want to support him as needed, and so that is my intent. Um, I like to stay apprised of the uh, Two Rivers work, and um, I think this will, you know, help me increase my engagement. So, as I say, I'm excited to support Jeff is where I'm at. That's great. Okay, any uh, questions for for Jeff, uh, really? And then also Jackie. Go ahead, Marcia. Yeah, I think that um, we really haven't heard much, you know, in terms of reports in the past. And I think that it would be good to have a regular report about what's going on at TROC. Cool. Um, Jeff, do you think, um, uh, do you think we can, uh, we can regularly hear maybe through the mechanisms of the planning commission. I know that they do some reporting of their subcommittees and, and, and what have you, perhaps you can make, I won't, we don't control that agenda, but perhaps that would be a good place for it. Can, can, I, can I just say that it, you know, it's my, uh, I have been, and I will continue to provide a report after each meeting. Yeah. Um, and I, really it's, it's the discretion of the planning commission, how they want to uh, share that report. But I, hmm. I, I doubt it's top secret information that will be uh, uh, difficult for them to share with you. But I, I can't, I can't speak for the planning commission. But certainly, I would have no problem with that being shared more broadly. Yeah. The, the meeting minutes are online, and it also indicates attendance. And indeed, Jeff has attended. Attended. <laughs> Go ahead, Marsha. Follow up. Yeah, I just never like to be um, sort of, you know, second copy. I'd like to have a, a copy sent to the, the board. We appoint you, and I think it would be good for us to know directly what, what you're learning and bring it back to us, as well as to the planning commission. Uh, that's fine with me. Uh, should I send it to Roger? Or Miranda? I, I'm, we're happy to, I think a great mechanism is to get any kind of reporter update and put it into our correspondence can, um, and uh, I think if the planning commission decides to put that mm -hmm. as part of their committee updates, that would be another great way to, you know, get it back to us um, that way as well. Yeah. But I know that you have also done some reporting. Yeah. Um, we, yeah, just to clarify, Roger, this is Jackie. We do include that in our updates uh, reporting on Two Rivers. So we do that routinely. Yep. Yep. Just let me know. Uh, uh, it's yeah. easy enough yeah. to copy whoever would like to be copied on that report. <laughs> okay. Are we, are we good? Okay. Um, great. So I'll, I'm will i happy to take a motion. Okay. I move to appoint Jeff Lubell as representative and Jacqueline Allen as alternate representative to the Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Commission for terms to expire on April 30th, 2023. Okay. Um, is there a second? Hold, hold on. Is there a second? <laughs> Okay, made by Mary, seconded by Claudette. Okay, Jeff, did you have a follow-up for discussion? Yeah, I, I just have a question as to why this is a one-year appointment as opposed to most of the other uh, appointments that you're making that are for multi-year terms. It's, it's really a question. I'm, I'll, I'll do it for one year or two years. I, it just means more times coming to, to these meetings to be reappointed. So I'm just curious what your, what the rationale is, if, if there is one. Good you. I, I, I don't necessarily... Um, I don't have an answer, but I think it's a good rhetorical question that we could answer in the future. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> I don't have an answer. I'll check. Yeah. 
Jackie, do you have an answer? Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, is it a two rivers practice? Because it's we've done it this way for a long time, and it, and maybe Sarah can answer that question. Uh, I'm not sure if other towns are also a one year appointment. Uh, so, so, so Rod's here. He'll an he'll answer that, and then we're gonna uh, yep. finish the motion on the table, and then we're gonna move on because we're 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 over, right? Um, go ahead, Rod. Hi. Hi. So you can confirm for me, but I understand it's a two rivers thing. It's an annual appointment process that they conduct and they update the list of appointed um, people in each town at the same time. So. That doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean that um, for when we have a reappointment, um, if we necessarily need to hear from our reappointments. Um, every year, right? There's different mechanisms that we can make our appointments to that board, right? So so I'll, I'll just, say that, right? Yeah, okay. You could do it that way. You could just inform them that it's the same person. Yeah. And have your own appointment schedule. You yeah. Could do that. Yeah. There's a challenge yeah. for us. All right. So um okay. So that's not helpful, but <laughs> broad answer. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, so there's a motion on the table. Can we vote on it? Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you, you, both of you, for being here. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. All right, so um, our blessed regional planner from Two Rivers um, has had great forbearance here. Um, so welcome, Sarah. Um, I'm going to... I uh, thank you for being here so late at night. I know that you've been probably doing a, a lot of work within your squeeze compressed day job. And so thank you for being here at 754. I'm going to have Rod introduce um, um, why we've asked you here and what are the sort of the goals of our broad conversation. So Rod, can you, can you do that for us? Hello, Sarah. Um, thanks for coming. And so um, board members and others, the purpose of having Sarah come tonight is to give a um, an overview of the current state of play with ARPA and to discuss uh, the best approaches that um, towns across the region have used to do two things. One is to identify uh, priorities for expending uh, ARPA funds and the other is to find the best way to engage the community in that decision-making process. Uh, and then lastly, uh, but related to both those items is finding ways to make sure that if there are matching funds available from the state programs, that, that the decisions that we make maximize our ability to access other funds. Was that spark you then? Was there something really weird with the audio? Your audio is, I think, perhaps if you turn your volume down, we get less reverb, but, you know, I, I, I know that I, it happens with my computer, too. But nonetheless, um, okay. we can turn it okay. It's better, but we'll work on it. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I've got, I've got issues. All right. <laughs> Mine. So, um, hi, Sarah. <laughs> can you all hear me? Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me this evening. My name is Sarah Rate. I work as a regional planner with Two Rivers Apache Regional Commission. Um, and I'd like to just start off with a brief presentation to give you all some grounding, common grounding in where we stand with Treasury's latest regulations with respect to ARPA. Um, so if it's okay, I'd like to go ahead and share my screen. Roger, would that be okay? Thank you. Okay, hey, can you all see that now? There should be a slide deck there. Yes. Beautiful. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead into presentation mode here. So again, thank you all. Um, let's start off with just some brief comments on timeline, which many of you I think are already familiar with. Um, ARPA monies are coming to local communities, that is towns and villages, in two equal tranches. The first tranche um, you should have received in August and September of last year of 2021. So you received 50% of your award. And the second 50% of your award is coming in August and September of this year. And Norwich's total allocation, as you may be aware, um, is just over $1 million, at about $1,019,000 that you're looking at. Some additional thoughts to keep in mind with regard to timing. 
ARPA dollars can be used to cover expenses that have been incurred since March 3rd of 2021. You must obligate all of your funds by the end of calendar year 2024, and you must expend all of your funds by the end of calendar year 2026. Any funds which are not spent by the end of 2026 must be returned to Treasury. So let's talk through the broad um, categories of what U.S. Treasury says that local communities are allowed to spend these ARPA dollars on. And there are really sort of four broad umbrellas um, of eligible use categories. And any of you who are familiar with Treasury's final rule for ARPA know that it's a massive document. It's incredibly complicated. And even if you look at the compliance and reporting guidance, you'll see that there are some, I think, over 80 eligibility categories. So it can get very dense. Um, and I do have good news this evening, which is that we can really minimize that confusion and minimize that complexity um, thanks to a uh, change that was made in the final rule by U.S. Treasury um, back in January when they published the final rule in, on January 6th. But just so you're aware, there are four broad categories of eligible uses. That is uh, lost revenue, which is provision of government services, pandemic response, so responding to the economic and public health impacts of the pandemic, premium pay to essential workers, and then water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, of which we've heard quite a lot in the news. Now, thankfully, because of the changes that happened on January 6th when they published the final rule, for communities that have received small awards, and Norwich is one of those, every single town in our, in our region is one of those, um, they, are, they have at their um, disposal the ability to focus exclusively on the lost revenue category. And this is really the recommendation of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns and also of Two Rivers, that every community in our region um, really maximize their flexibility in spending their funding and minimize their administrative burden by focusing in on that lost revenue category. Um, so I want to dive into that just a little bit more so that we can understand what that lost revenue category is. It's also called revenue replacement. Again, it's the easiest and most flexible approach to using your local ARPA dollars. Basically, what Treasury said is they decided that they were going to come up with a standard allowance of $10 million that is considered revenue loss due to the COVID pandemic. They're basically, Treasury said, okay, we're going to assume that every community, regardless of the size of the community, regardless of the population of the community, regardless of the actual impacts of COVID on that community, we're going to assume that every single community, town, village, city in America lost $10 million as a result of the COVID pandemic. And the reason why they created the standard allowance is if you were following the ARPA discussions before January 6th, when they issued the final rule, they had originally asked communities to use a very, very complicated formula to come up with an actual calculation of how much they had lost as a result of COVID, which was creating so many headaches and really was not worth the administrative burden that was going into it. So Treasury said, all right, that's fine. We're going to say that there's a standard allowance. Every community can claim $10 million. Now, if you have an award that is less than $10 million, which obviously is the case for Norwich, that means you can claim the entirety of your award as revenue replacement dollars. And by doing so, you can use those funds for any service that's traditionally provided by a government, excluding the restricted uses in ARPA, which I'm going to cover in, in just a moment. But basically, that is going to really maximize your flexibility in being able to use those funds. If you decide to allocate the entirety of your award towards revenue replacement, you are not closing off any doors whatsoever. You're just maximizing your ability to use those dollars in a flexible way. And you are not limited. When it talks about services traditionally provided by a government, you're not limited to the services that the town of Norwich has provided in past years or even during the pandemic, it's really interpreted so broadly that it's any type of service provided by a state, a county, a city, a town, anywhere in America at any point in time. So you can see how incredibly broad this is. It can include direct assistance payments to businesses, to individuals. It can include any of the projects that are eligible under any of the other categories that we talked about um, in ARPA, the, the premium pay, the water sewer broadband infrastructure, 
all of those other projects can be covered under the revenue replacement. And the benefit there is that the reporting requirements under revenue replacement are vastly reduced compared to those other categories in other eligible use categories in ARPA. The other thing to consider about reporting is, well, the other thing to consider about the other eligible use categories is that those other categories in the final rule often have certain eligibility limitations that you're not going to experience under revenue replacement. So for example, if you would wanted to give a grant to a business in the community that was really struggling as a result of COVID, if you wanted to do that um, award under the economic impacts section of ARPA, you would have to meet certain burdens of proof to show that that business was meeting eligibility criteria as Treasury defined them. But under the revenue replacement category, you do not have to follow Treasury's guidance in terms of who gets a grant and who doesn't get a grant. All of those sort of eligibility and benefits criteria fall away. And again, you have the maximum amount of flexibility to use your funds, your dollars under the revenue replacement category. So you can see the advantage there. You can also include administrative expenses under the revenue replacement category. So that means um, the staff, town staff time that is incurred as, as you are actually administering this award and making, uh, making projects happen. You can hire a consultant even to help you um, to help administer this award. You can pay for legal expenses if you need to consult a lawyer um, in making sure that you're using your funds appropriately. So you, again, you can put those administrative expenses under the revenue replacement category. There is one strategy that I want to bring up to share with you all, and we've been trying to slowly spread the word about it to um, towns in our region. And some, this may be appropriate for some towns and it may be appropriate, it may not be appropriate for other towns. It really depends on sort of where you're at and what makes sense for your community and the kinds of projects that you're contemplating. But I wanted to share this with you because VLCT has blessed it as um, a legally appropriate strategy um, and a fiscally appropriate strategy if you choose to take it. Because revenue replacement dollars can be used for the provision of any government service, one thing that you can, so a, one approach you can take to using your ARPA funds is to pay off the non contract portions of your current operating budget. So that's salaries and benefits for town staff, um, which would then free up funds within your general fund. And those freed up funds lose their federal character entirely. They are no longer bound by any of the ARPA regulations. They are not bound by the ARPA timeline. So you can see how that really does even further your flexibility if you were to follow that strategy. The other benefit to this strategy of paying off the non-contract portions of your current operating budget is that it allows you to sidestep the federal procurement regulations, which you would otherwise be um, held to if you wanted to, for example, do an infrastructure project using your ARPA dollars, you would have to make sure that you're following uniform guidance in terms of how you bid that project out and how you how you actually execute the procurement process. So this is a strategy for folks to consider as a way of um, further increasing the flexibility that you have to use your dollars. So let's talk about what the no's are because there's a short list and they're very clear. Um, as to what you cannot spend your ARPA dollars on. The first of those is that you cannot make extraordinary contributions to a pension fund in order to reduce accrued liability. So anything above and beyond what you normally be paying as um, part of a regular paycheck, that is not an acceptable use of ARPA dollars. You're not allowed to use your ARPA dollars to replenish a rainy day, rainy day fund or hold it in financial reserve funds. Um, and that's something that is important to keep in mind. I think some folks have sort of um, lost track of that in their conversations about ARPA at the local level. And, and folks think, oh, well, what if we were to have like an emergency contingency fund for you know future pandemic outbreaks? Could we put the ARPA dollars in there? And that's not acceptable. So again, stay away from any sort of squirreling away of money in reserve funds. You are not allowed to use ARPA dollars to service debt um, of any kind regardless of when that debt was incurred. So you cannot use it to pay back old loans. You can't use it to initiate a new loan. Um, be very, very cognizant of that. Also, Treasury makes it clear that 
ARPA dollars should not be used to um, undertake projects that contravene CDC guidance with regard to COVID-19. So the, the commonly cited example is you shouldn't, for example, be building a jail using ARPA dollars because that is bringing a large number of people into a small area and further um, furthering the spread of COVID. So those kinds of projects. Um, and then all, also projects need to comply with all the regulations that are referenced in your award documentation. Remember that when you certified your award for your award, you signed two documents. You signed an award terms and conditions document, and you also signed um, an assurances of compliance with civil rights law documents. So you may have to make sure that you are compliant with those two documents in particular, and then all other applicable federal, state, and local laws. I do want to make a quick note here on reporting because we are coming up on um, the first due date. You have a obligation to U.S. Treasury to make an annual report on your progress in using these funds. The first report is going to cover the period of March 2021 through March 2022. It's due April 30th. You have to make that report even if you have not spent any funding yet. Um, and that report is going to be critical because that is the report in which you will decide whether your town is going to take the standard allowance. The other option that Treasury gives you is to use that complicated formula and come up with a calculation of what you actually lost, which honestly, for almost every single town, I'm sure in our region, that's not going to be to your benefit and it's not worth the energy or time. Um, but if you do not declare that you're going to use the standard allowance in this first annual report, you lose that opportunity. So again, important deadline, make sure that you're aware of that. The reporting process is initiated by the designated authorized representative for your community. And they've been receiving communications, so they should be aware of um, what is being asked of them. Once they are in the Treasury's portal, they can assign reporting roles to other people if that makes more sense. But again, we're just trying to get the message out to folks to get started as soon as possible um, because that reporting deadline is coming up. And I can't tell you how many phone calls I've had in the past couple of weeks alone just from folks who are hitting hurdles just trying to get into the Treasury's portal. Any of you who are familiar with federal work know that federal websites are hard to navigate, and this is certainly no exception. Um, so with that, I am going to go ahead and uh, end my show and stop sharing here. And I know that Rod had brought up some questions about using um, ARPA dollars as federal match, or a mat, excuse me, match to other grant programs. Um, and then there's also some discussion about, you know, local decisions around projects. I will say a few words about using ARPA dollars as matched to other programs. VSAT has done a really great job of rounding up a list of state funding opportunities and other federal funding opportunities that are slowly being stood up. Some of them are actually funded through the state's ARPA allocation because they got their own pot of money. Um, some are funded through other programs. There are still bills that are trickling through the state legislature that may be, you know, dropping more money into the laps of municipalities coming up soon. For example, um, Bill 518 is, is currently in the Senate, um, and that would give grants to municipalities to do energy conservation efficiency and fuel switching projects within municipally owned buildings. So that is huge. That's been a a uh, use that many communities have been considering using their local ARPA dollars, fund, dollars to fund. And now there's this opportunity to potentially get an alternative funding source through the state to cover those projects. So it's worth keeping your ear to the ground and being aware of those other opportunities. Also recognizing that many of the funding opportunities that do exist or will exist right now are still not, they're still nascent. They're, they're not yet fully formed. The programs haven't been stood up. Obviously the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which is coming through the federal pipeline has not yet been stood up yet. We don't have um, those pipelines in place to actually get funding on the ground. So VLCT has sort of been in this difficult position where they've been encouraging towns to, to wait and, and be patient and, and be aware of these other funding opportunities that are coming through. And so that's really a judgment call that the town has to make um, as, you're, as you're sorting through your various competing needs and demands on, on your funding. If you choose to use your ARPA dollars to um, match other grant programs that you are trying to take advantage of, be aware that there is sort of a, it's really sort of hit and miss in terms of what agencies will accept ARPA dollars, local ARPA dollars as a match for their programs. Treasury had initially intended that um, 
this that that local arbor dollar funds could be used broadly as a match for any federal program, but that has been whittled away as things do as they move through the federal pipeline. And so really right now we're in this position where some agencies have like requested waivers where they've rejected um, local communities ability to use their local arbor dollars as match. So right now, the best message that I can give you about using arpa dollars as match is that you need to talk to every funder that you're considering working with and ask them specifically, can we use our local ARPA dollars as match for your program? Um, and then they will make that determination and, and let you know. Um, if you have a project that has a big capital stack with multiple funders, you need to have that conversation with all of the funders if the match is, is sort of being distributed amongst them. So be aware of that. Um, and at that point, I'm going to pause and, and I'm happy to take any questions and then help talk through any concerns or, or um, questions about the regulations. It's really great, Sarah. Thanks so much. I, I have one sort of broad question before before I open it up. How um, to, to board member questions. So how, in your experience working with communities, are towns and municipal managers dealing with sort of um, the reality of, you know, this fund going to known or existing projects, right, that may have been deferred or delayed and that this is an important windfall. How do communities balance that with sort of the more popular narrative of this being a once in a generation sort of opportunity for funding and that it should be put towards, you know, a community vision or, you know, a community project or community goal. So can you talk about how people are sort of, uh, how boards and what the conversations are between sort of knowing what projects are baked from your capital planning, but then also knowing that there's a real public engagement process and like how they're meeting those, those needs. That's a large question, but I think you get it. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's really a question that the answer is going to vary from town to town. And we've seen a great diversity of approaches to ARPA across the region. Um, from a regulatory standpoint, ARPA strongly encourages that there be some sort of public process informing decisions about the use of these ARPA dollars, but there are no prescriptions for exactly what that process should look like. Um, and so, you know, there are towns that are really taking this sort of from the perspective that they have already identified through their capital budget planning process, specific infrastructure projects, they've already had a public deliberation process through that capital budget planning work that they've done, and they've determined that those are community priorities, and this is a um, expedient pot of money that can be used to further those projects. And so they're really just focusing their money on those pre-identified projects. There are communities that have sort of started... Um, at the drawing board and, and done a community input session where they've asked folks to come forward and share any and all ideas for how these, these dollars could be used. Um, and then they are taking that broad universe of ideas and they're whittling it down based on um, evalu evaluation criteria that have been uh, sort of discussed and communally approved by the folks who are participating in those meetings, um, in those community conversations. So, there's sort of there's there's many different ways of approaching how you sort of make the decision of okay, do we spend money on established projects? What about these nascent projects that have been sort of percolating in communities' minds and maybe they haven't been brought forward yet? But now is a really great time to do that. The narrative that this is a once in a lifetime funding stream is somewhat true and it's somewhat not right because these kinds of these kinds of um, projects are not only able to be funded through ARPA in most cases, right? There are other existing grant programs out there. Um, we know that there's more federal money that's coming down the pipe through IAJA, and that's going to cover a lot of um, infrastructure needs. So, like, I, I would be nervous um, to cling too tightly to that narrative because I think that there are there are many different ways to climb a mountain, right? There there are many many paths up a mountain, and so. Um, trying to just build that hope in the community that, you know, you have the, you have the know-how, you have the resources um, and the excellent town staff to help you go after additional funding opportunities above and beyond your ARPA dollars. Um, so it can be very hard, I think, for communities when there are so many different competing interests at the table and they're all sort of vying for the same pot of money. And I think trying to broaden people's vision and help people understand that 
um, this isn't the, the end all and be all that there are, there are more opportunities and the community will be supported in seeking those other funding opportunities is an important part of the conversation. Does that help at all? That's really great. Thanks so much. Um, that was, yes. Um, do board members have um, sort of any questions for, for Sarah? Go ahead, Mary. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for this presentation. It's really helpful. Um, I was wondering if there's any rule of thumb, if, for instance, we hired a consultant to administ administer our ARPA award uh, just for the scale of what they should be compensated, you know, what, what kind of time or, you know, could it be thought of as a percentage or what's reasonable and how, you know, it wouldn't want to overdo it or underdo it, if that makes sense. That's a really great question, Mary. And I, all I can really speak to is the regulatory um, language around that. And surprisingly, I think for many of us who are familiar with the federal grant landscape, this is something of a shocker. Um, there is no prescription on the allowable percentage of direct um, administrative costs for this program. So that really opens the door to um, the consultant sort of setting their own um, proposal forward for, for you know, how much money it would, it would require to do what's being asked of them. In terms of indirect costs, um, the, the word from Treasury is if you have an approved indirect cost rate, then you are required to use that rate. Otherwise, use the de minimis 10% indirect um, cost rate, which is sort of the standard for federal programs across the board. But in terms of direct costs, which is what you're talking about for hiring a consultant, um, there, there is no set percentage. So in terms of what's reasonable, I think it's really important to look at what you're asking them to do and make sure that you're getting multiple bids um, so that you can compare different consultants' proposals. Does that help? Sort of. I mean, would it vary um, according to the type of project or, or use of funds that you had to track? In other words, a very complicated um, project would have more reporting requirements and so it would require more time, something like that. I, I would say that that's true. The reporting requirements for ARPA are going to be minimal, thankfully, if you choose to allocate the entirety of, of your award under the revenue replacement category. Honestly, your reporting requirements are going to be incredibly streamlined. All you're going to have to say is X amount of money for this project and use maybe like a couple sentences to describe that project. It's incredibly easy from a federal perspective, like that, that almost never happens. Um, so again, that's another reason to, to use that category. But if you are doing, for example, a complicated infrastructure project that involves permitting state, you know, state interfacing, that is probably going to involve more consultant costs because you're going to need somebody with the expertise to, to navigate you deftly through those various processes. And it would really be the reporting and the paperwork that happens outside of ARPA that they would outside be charging ARPA. for. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. I want to do about 10 more minutes um, of this, but um, just as an FYI, but Claudette, I think I saw your hand. No, did I make that up? <laughs> you didn't see my hand, um, but I had, I do have a question. Okay, go for it. Um, Sarah, I, I, can you explain again the, the, um, the non, I think you mentioned taking out non-contract wages. And sure. how, mm -hmm. Run that by me again, please. Sure. So basically, it's, it's something you can think of it sort of as a short circuit approach <laughs> to using your ARPA dollars. Um, and you're basically swapping money out of your general funds. So the idea is, if you were to take, let's, let's take an example of, um, let's say that the town wanted to do an infrastructure project using its ARPA dollars. To do that infrastructure project, you would have to make sure if you just wanted to spend like you, right now you have ARPA dollars sitting in um, a special revenue fund for the town. If you just wanted to use your dollars straight out of your special revenue fund, you would need to make sure that you are following all of the federal regulations um, in uniform guidance. So that is largely focused around procurement, like how many bids you're getting. Is it going to be you know, competitively procured? 
but there are other provisions of uniform guidance that you'd have to make sure that you're following. Um, and generally you just need to make sure that you are sticking by all of the rules in ARPA's books, including the timeline, right? So you need to make sure that your, your infrastructure project could get done on the timeline that is specified through the ARPA final rule. If, however, you were to take the shortcut approach, what you could do instead is you could use your ARPA dollars and you could pay off the salaries and benefits of town staff for, for example, the next three years, whatever, whatever makes sense um, within your budget. That will then free up those dollars that would have been just part of your general fund, right? Because now suddenly they're, they've been covered by a different source. So you have this pot of freed up money and that freed up money is no longer federal in nature. It is not subject to ARPA regulations. It's not subject to the ARPA timeline. And so you have vastly increased your flexibility in spending that money. And on top of that, because you used your ARPA dollars to pay off, when you, when you took the ARPA dollars directly from your special revenue fund, you used it to pay off salaries and benefits. You don't have to worry about any sort of uniform guidance regulations impacting that payment, right? So it's a way of sidestepping federal procurement regulations because you're going to end up with a pot of freed up money that no longer has to follow those regulations. Um, and, and it's just a way to sort of minimize the administrative burden even further for towns. Does that and, help? And Sarah, that includes the timeline of 24 and 26? So, right. So if you were to take um, the ARPA dollars and pay off salaries and benefits, um, that would mean that you would need to have spent all of the, the ARPA dollars by the end of calendar year 2026, December 31st, 2026. So you would have to make sure that you've covered general fund expenses up to that point, and that's when you stop. And then the, the money that gets freed up within your operating budget, that has no timeline. You could, you could do projects with that through the next 10 years if you wanted to. Right. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, does that, that answer your question, Cleta? Yeah, okay, uh, go ahead, Marsha. Thank you, Sarah, for the presentation. Before I forget it, can you um, share a copy of that deck with us? Absolutely, I'll send it to Rod afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, my question is, even though that uh, approach with using the lost revenue approach for um, expenses, it helps us under federal law. I don't see how it helps us under state law because that money was voted by people for a certain purpose. Now we've got money that is basically extra money that hasn't been voted. And so I'm thinking that's a problem. And I'm wondering how other people have addressed that problem because it seems to me you'd have to go back to the people, to the, um, public and ask for direction? That's a really great question. Thank you, Marcia. And I'm sorry, I didn't touch on that earlier. So the if you were to use your ARPA funds directly from your special revenue fund for a project, that decision-making authority lies solely with the select board. That is the legislative body that has been about in sort of imbued with the power by treasury to make that decision. If you were to take that short circuit approach and like create a surplus effectively within your general fund, yes, you are going to have to follow whatever your town's current procedures are with regard to how the disposition of surpluses. And so that may mean for your community going back to a town vote. VLCT has sort of been putting out the message that there is no state regulation um, that specifically mandates that there be a town vote on surpluses. I'm not a lawyer. I can't speak to that. Um, what I can say confidently is that, you know, your town attorney will know what the proper procedure is, either just for your town or with regard to state statute. Um, and so you're going to need to follow that, certainly, if you end up in this position where you are short-circuiting and creating a surplus within your general. Okay. Um, and my third question is, uh, if we needed to talk to you again, will you come back? Absolutely. Yep. At any time. And I also forgot to mention too, that I'm available to help with sort of facilitating community dialogues. Um, that's part of our mandate from the state too, is to assist communities. If you decide to have some sort of public discussion, public meeting, I'm happy to help with that. And I think I want to just uh, 
that's a great transition to, I, I, I don't have to get the last word, but I think a good final question is, you know, I think we're, I think we have some, the board has some, board and community have some level of awareness about a municipal building um, that could benefit from ARPA funds, not only through the mechanisms of capital planning, but through a very sort of public conversation around, around its renovation. So, but, um, but that being said, you know, there is, a, I think, a, a desire, tension, interest in, you know, also using perhaps a smaller, pot if you will you know for for like real like you know real community feedback I'm not saying that's necessarily the mechanism that this board is thinking of we haven't necessarily explicitly discussed it but nonetheless you by way of sort of wrapping up can you just talk a little bit about sort of how legislative bodies um have um um, worked uh, in further it, furtherance of this, right? Have they sort of created a set of criteria and developed an application process for formal proposals? Um, if they were, if there, let's say, if there was an interest in, you know, hearing or spending money from the community, are there committees? Um, have you, um, have you, and then what, and then finally, what kind of information? What kind of information and facilitation sessions have you have you run to date? So basically, like, what are some of the public engagement options that we have that you have seen? Um, sure, would be a good question. Sure. So <laughs> maybe again, a pretty broad gamut, I think, across our region. Um, everything from uh, sort of. I think there were some sort of communities that started off with some broad visioning sessions um, and sort of a needs assessment, community conversations, um, and then they moved into more specific sort of project proposal community discussions. Some communities just started off with, okay, let's let's just have a meeting. We'll, we'll just talk about ARPA um, and let's have everybody bring whatever ideas they have to the table. Um, some communities have not had that sort of public outreach at all, and they're really just relying on their capital budget plan, and they'll have perhaps a public hearing as part of a select board meeting to confirm that. Um, some communities are thinking about just doing a written uh, proposal process whereby community members are um, solicited to provide written project descriptions to um, either town staff or to a committee. Um, and that then get evaluated according to criteria that have been collectively discussed and, and approved. Um, in terms of our committees, there are a number of them that are springing up in our region and certainly many around the state. VLCT has put together a helpful toolkit um, with some resolution language and then some other just sort of procedural guidance for creating an ARPA committee. Um, and so I would, I would encourage you to check out their website to, to see those resources if you're interested in that kind of a process. Um, in terms of my own involvement so far, the community meetings that I've been asked to attend have really been focused around um, bringing people together for the express purpose of generating ideas for the use of ARPA funds um, and then trying to winnow down those ideas a little bit more by, by more narrowly defining them and also evaluating them um, against evaluation criteria that we've discussed as a group and, and um, fleshed out together. So that's really been my role in, in helping folks um, in, in a public engagement setting. And then of course, I'm always available by phone, if folks have conversation, have questions, or want to have a conversation about, you know, an ARPA committee formation process or something to that effect. Um, but again, like it's, it has been very diverse across our region and certainly across our state. And ultimately, the decision making power lies with the select board. Um, so any sort of work that's done by the committee would be advisory only. Okay. Okay, that's this is really great. I, I I think we're this is an amazing and helpful first step in how to talk about how to talk about uh, ARPA, right? So, so thank you so much, Sarah, and uh, for being here and for your forbearance and um, you know as we got through our committee appointments, um, Rod, um, what do you sort of see um, uh, as sort of if, uh, a next step with the ARPA discussion, and then we'll we'll end this agenda item. Thank you, Roger. Yes. So, and yes, thank you so much, Sarah. That was great. So, 
I see, um, first of all, getting a hold of the presentation that, uh, that Sarah put together, which is very useful, and circulating that to the board and making that available maybe on the town website uh, as a backup. And then I think that the board needs to um, encounter this issue again as an agenda item responding to what you've heard tonight. So I propose it at the next meeting or the following meeting after that, um, whereby you express preferences about um, the approach that you're gonna prefer to take with regard to uh, the first big one, which is that question of whether to proceed, assuming that we're going to use upper money to replace uh, on contract services in the general fund and then free ourselves from the ongoing restrictions on the use of federal funds or whether the projects and the kind of activity that the town envisages could be initiated and spent in the time frame that we have under the upper question. So it seems to me that the first big question, the first cut, if you like, is can we do stuff by 2026 and pay for it? And if we're confident that we can, what are those kinds of things? Mm -hmm. And so given the current economic climate um, and the lack of uh, availability of engineering support and a variety of other professional services, we might conclude that depending on the kinds of projects that we want to do, we might want to try and work the system so that we are not constrained by the 2026 deadline. But if we think we've got a range of smaller things that we can bid out, get done, and be finished with by 2026, then that, that's the other course to take. So we think that's the first cut. And then after that, um, to use the buckets analogy, one big bucket, I think, uh, looking at the existing capital improvement plan and what kinds of projects we think that we want to undertake. We know historically that we've had a lot of discussion about energy retrofits for Tracy Hall and other public facilities. Uh, we know that there are things that we would like to, to, to proceed in that regard. If that's what this, the description for a good set of projects, then we should proceed in that path acknowledging that we need to still build a, um, a, a public participation track um, to ensure that we continue to have buy-in from the community about what we're doing. Great. Okay, thanks, uh, Claudette, and then then we'll, we'll move on, if that's okay. Yeah, and I would also think, do we need to decide as a legislative body whether we take the, uh, the standard allowance Yes, um, which I think, it, and able to, in order to get the report done by the end of April, that would seem to me to be a priority for our next meeting. Yes, I agree. I should say that I was assuming the, the obvious thing to do is to take the, the to take it. <laughs> I don't. I mean, if you wanted to, if, if, yeah, if, I would, if you I would wanted, too, but you know, I think we we as a body need to vote on that. And, yes, you do. Um, yes, you we'll do. Come back. We'll come back. Or it should yes. be at our next meeting for sure. Yep. Right, and, but that only gives us three days to make sure that the treasury site works. I know. And well, and yeah. we. And we just so folks know, I believe we designated the previous town manager. So uh, I think Rod is actively working on getting um, getting that change so we can like not get any cogs in the, the federal website wheel. Yeah. Okay. Um, go ahead, uh, Sarah, please. And then, yeah. Just to note, Rod, if you have any trouble on that front, please reach out. Um, I'm happy to help troubleshoot as best I can. Um, and you can go ahead and take those steps of getting into the portal, which is really, I think, the heaviest lift before the select board needs to make an actual decision, just so that you can get all the logistical hurdles out of the way um, up front. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, Marcia, did you have a follow-up question? I, and then I, I really do want to move on, if that's okay. Um, having struggled for years trying to get into federal portals, um, I'm thinking, you know, deadline time comes and they're just clogged and you can't get in. So um, w what's the fine? What's the hammer that comes down if we don't get in? 
Sarah, do you, do you, do you have a sense? Just it don't do it, not, right? <laughs> it has not been made um, explicit what the hammer is. I would strongly encourage you to not um, mm-hmm, yeah. take that misstep. There's been frightening discussions about treasury clawback of funding lately. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think it's going to be important mm-hmm. that everybody mm-hmm. make sure that they've crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's. Claudette, you truly get the final word and then we're moving. Yeah, and, and I would guess because this, the, the reporting deadlines have been out there for months that there would be no slack. Right. Okay, well, um, that's a good note as any to end on. Um, with with so much, so much thanks to Sarah. Um, this has been really helpful and wonderful. Um, so thank you. Thank you. I'll take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right, folks. So I'm going to try to get through the next two agenda items, and then I think we've earned a break before the town manager's report and before the CCI. So let's go to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, an approval of um, some police department expenditure requests. I think it's appropriate to begin with a motion, if that's okay. Okay, I'll move that. I move to approve the purchase of body armor replacements for the police department from the Safariland group in the amount of $2,979, half of which cost will be reimbursed by a regular state of Vermont grant resulting in a net cost of $1,489.89. Okay, is there a second, Claudette? Second, and just a question that this fund, this funding will be coming out of the special equipment, the police department's special equipment fund. Okay. Yes, thank you, thank you for that, yes. Okay, so made by Mary, seconded um, by Claudette, who, who clarified the designated fund source. Um, any discussion? Go ahead, Marcia question um the grant is that fairly assured or is that a hope um rod would you like to answer i my my understanding is this was this is a uh, perennially achieved grant but i know that only from the from getting it before in my time <laughs> but go ahead my, um, yes my my understanding is that it's just sort of a standing offer grant that we are eligible that if we apply we'll receive it and that the terms of it grant are as explained in the email from Chief Keel. Any, any further questions? All right, so I'm, I'm happy to call the, to call the question. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. There's a second motion uh, relating to this um, agenda item. Mary, would you like to make it? Yes, um, I move to approve the expenditure of $2,985.76 or repairs to the 2013 Ford Police Interceptor Sedan per the quote by Co-op Service Center. Okay, is there a second? Made by Mary, seconded by Claudette. Um, oh, and also to clarify that this is coming from the Cruiser Fund, is that right? Yep, okay. Um, any further discussion? Not seeing any, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I think that was that covers the police department expenditure agenda item. Is that right? Yes, it does. Okay. And so we'll just move on to the next um, one, which is the town clerk expenditure request for records digitization. Um, let's take a let's take a, a motion and then I think we should hear a little bit of an explanation about this because um Okay. Go ahead, Mary. I, I move to approve the purchase of services from COT Systems for the scanning and indexing of the town clerk's land records and attachments in the amount of $26,058. And that would be from the records restoration designated fund. Okay. Yep. All right. Is there a second? Um, seconded by Claudette. All right, um, Rod. Could you? I know this is um, from the from our clerk. Um, can you can you contextualize this a little bit, like um, uh, if you can? Yeah, certainly. So, so Cot Systems is one of our regular vendors in the town clerk space, and um, one of the things that they do is provide um, digitization of his of archive records, and so um, this 
is an ongoing project that the town clerk has um, argued successfully for in previous budgets. There's a reserve fund identified for this purpose. And this is the most recent phase um, proposed for uh, digitizing a set of volumes in the land records. And uh, so it would involve scanning and scanning and indexing those records um, from volumes 72 to 91 and attachments that go with it from six to seven. So uh, I think the easiest way to explain this is that it's just an ongoing project of the town clerk to constantly try and digitize the existing records. Okay, thanks so much. Um, any further discussion or questions? Go ahead, Ron. Uh, sure. Oh, Bonnie's here. Oh, hi, Bonnie. I didn't know that you were here. Anything further that you would like to add? This also will give us the flexibility to get the records online um, and open for people to go through them and purchase them through online uh, rather than having to come in the office. So it, it allows me to have at least a 40-year search online for researchers and, and attorneys and real estate. Okay. Thank you so much, Bonnie. I didn't, um, I didn't recognize your number. Um, um, any, Marsha, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, Bonnie, I was kind of concerned because it says that there are, under the disclaimers, there's no representations or warranties regarding images, their completeness or security. And so that brings up to my mind, you know, three questions. Um, one, you know, they're not warranting that these things are going to be complete when they're finished. Security is always an issue as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I'm wondering if it's because there's a six month time frame to accept the work if that means that we would need additional help because it, presumably you have to do some proofing to make sure that it's working. And I guess the final question is, do we already have access for this set up or is it done via the web so that we don't have to purchase something extra to, to facilitate people being able to access records this way? Bonnie, do you- No, you won't have to, you won't have to purchase anything extra, Marsha. It's- it's already part of the COT system, which is also record room and resolution. So the reason I have hesitated in the past to put the documents online is because I couldn't, I couldn't do a 40 year search all at one time. And I was worried about people missing, missing information and thinking they had done a complete title search. Right. And we have not had any issues really as far as proofing. They come into the office and they scan the documents right there in the office. So the books do not leave the building um, when they are being scanned. And as far as security, I think they're as secure as anything else could possibly be on the Internet. Um, I have not heard any reason or heard anything about security breaches with this system. And we've been on it now, I believe since 2012. So we have had a 10 year relationship with them. Okay. I think that's the best that I can do to assure the security. So no, um, no issues of records disappearing or not being complete when people find them. no 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 they they you know if if anything were to be tampered with and and they won't have the ability to do that these are read-only documents that they'll have the ability uh to print off any any um any foul play, so to speak, would have to be done right now from one or two computers, which are the 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 clerk com computer and Judy's computer. Um, all the data is inputted through our computers, and everything is double proofed before we re release those documents uh, to the portal. Okay. okay. So I was I, just. I, 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 
I would like to move, move on if that's okay, Marsha. Uh, unless... Yes, I just really want to ask this one question. Is there okay. ever a time, ever a time have you found where like a, a deed or a writ or anything was half there? Um, no, there isn't. Um, and in the event that that were to happen and it was brought to our attention, we could rescan and replace that document right from our office. Great. Thank you. Okay. This is great. So um, I'll, I'll call the question, um, if that's okay, unless we're good. All right. So uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Rod. Um, um, so all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. Unanimous. All right. Um, so folks, I'm going to, uh, it's 848. Um, we have a town manager report. And then we also added to the agenda, the approval of the CCI expenditure for some uh, computer purchases. So I'm going to give us um, a generous break and come back at nine. And then I would really like us to work through the town manager report and the CCI thing in 10 minutes, like truly like nine, 10, it's done. And then, and then the remaining time for our, our session. So I'll see you at nine. Okay. We'll take a break. Recording stopped.
It's nine. All right, I'm going to resume the recording. Recording in progress. Okay, resuming the April 13th select board meeting at nine. Um, okay, so the next item on the agenda is, uh, well, it's two agenda items. So the next item on the agenda is the CCI um, exp approval of the CCI expenditure for some computers and some related peripherals. Um, so we had some uh, information that was sent to us. There was an addendum to the packet. Um, Rod, I don't know if you've come back to us, but uh, do you have do you, anything that you would like to bring to our attention that's not self-evident in the documents? <laughs> How's that? <laughs> you could say no, too. <laughs> Seem pretty complete. Okay. All right. So he's saying no. Okay. So does anyone have any questions about the, the CCI proposal for the expenditure of computers? This is obviously a long time coming. Some of these computers are 10 years old. Um, go ahead, um, uh, Claudette. Yeah, Roger, you mentioned peripherals and um, the motion just says desktops and laptops, but the peripherals weren't. I think it was one peripheral. I think it might've been a, 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 a cord. So sorry, it could be, go ahead, Ron, do you want to correct my mistake? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to keep this as brief and ungeeky as possible, but it. So because the computers we have are so old, the monitors are also 10 years old and they don't make monitors and computers like that anymore. So to make a new computer, um, send a signal to an old monitor, you need a special adapter to go back in time. And so the peripherals that Roger mentioned are these special little adapters that allow you to plug in a brand new computer to a 10 year old monitor Perfect. until we get new monitors, <laughs> which is also on the, on the cards, but that's a different thing altogether. And we won't, we won't get those through CCI. We'll probably just go and get a, you know, hunt the, it's a personal preference thing and people's people's office settings are different. Some people want big screens and have room for them. Some people won't. Uh, so it'll be a, it's one of those things that takes a little bit of time of working through. And I'm not sure the staff are really even aware of, if you like, what the possibilities are. Okay. Um, Marcia, do you have a question? Yeah, just very briefly. Is everybody getting a new computer? Yes. Okay. Everybody, everybody at a workstation is getting a new computer except for Ben Trussell, the, the, the building custodian and he is getting the most recent existing computer and he has a very light set of demands being able to surf the web do email and check his calendar and so the expectation is that um, because that's the only function he functions he uses he should be able to get away with the least ancient existing computer yes and we're vulnerable on windows 7 so geez yep um, all right. Um, go ahead, Marcia, follow up. Yeah. So for somebody like, say, Bree, who's running around doing stuff, um, what, is there an option to do something like a laptop if, if they wanted, if she wanted? All staff, all, staff, all staff were asked as to what their preferences were. Those that express the preference for a laptop and could justify the additional expense in terms of their work are being supplied with a laptop. That includes print. Great. All right, any further board discussion or questions? All right, I'll take public comment. Sherilyn, oh, go ahead, Rob, please. Go ahead. Yeah, just quickly, those adopters, I mean, it's nitpicking, and but it's worth mentioning that those uh, adopters for the monitors, we buy them by the dozen for the high school. Uh, and that $27 cost is like twice what the cost on Amazon. Uh, laptops and computers are in short supply in a lot of places. You can't shop around for those. Right. But, you know, it's a minor aspect, but. Yes. 
Okay. Yeah. Understood. Um, I'll take public comment. Um, go ahead, Cheryl. And as a, as a suggestion that I made earlier, please consider um, phrasing your public comment as a comment. I didn't understand what you said. Please what? Please consider phrasing your public comment as a public comment, as a comment oh. and a question. Yeah, but go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, since since the uh, listers are thrilled to, and the office in total are thrilled about this, um, I was just wanting to ask the question about the computers that are being purchased. There seems to be a slight difference. Uh, we, we haven't had a conversation with you, Rod, but we're just really excited because of the age of what we're working on. Um, there's a slight difference between the two that are being purchased, and I was curious about that. I'm not, I'm not sure which two you're referring to. So there's a desk, there's a standard desktop model, which is the equivalent, and it's got equivalent power and capacity to the um, the, the one of the two laptops that are being um, purchased. And so the Lister's office is a st static setting, um, and it's a straight replacement for the machines. Um, so yeah. That's the explanation there. My 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 sense of reading the line item one says elite and one doesn't. That was sort of my differentiation. But you're, you're you're referencing you're referencing the ones that are being replaced, the ones that are there now. Not the, they're all being replaced with the, the same Lenovo okay. machine. Okay, I didn't read everything. Sorry. Yep, that's okay. Okay, great. Um. Yes, and uh, as the report makes clear. Some of these are 11 years old. So thank you, Rod, for, um, I know that you were, when you were a planner um, or director of planning, you were sort of sort of consulting or part of a team on this, and now you've led us to it. So thank you for that. Um, all right. Um, so please, I'm sorry, for, for, for forbearance. Did we take the motion? No, not yet. Can you make a motion? Great. Thank you. <laughs> So I move to approve the purchase of six desktop computers and six laptop computers for a total amount of $14,625 to be paid from the General Administration Reserve Fund. Okay. Second. Second. Okay, made by Claudette, seconded by Mary. Any further discussion? This is great. Okay, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, great. All right, we did it in seven minutes. All right, yes, everyone's excited. That's wonderful. All right, so um, the next item on the agenda is the, well, well we separated out the town manager report. Um, I'll, why don't we, uh, I think it was a, as always, it was helpful and clear uh, rather than ask Rod to, to uh, give him the time to, to give us the highlights in, in, in words. Does anyone have any questions for Rod? Go ahead, Mary. Um, in our uh, former meeting, we had been talking about visiting different departments, uh, you know, in order just to become more familiar with them. And I'm wondering whether I had kind of approached Rod about going in individually and touring DPW and maybe talking to Rec. But I'm wondering if this is it's still a good time. I was thinking of doing that soon. Or would it be better if we just held off? And try to and try to figure out how to do it as as a group and warn it because that was one of our questions. The only thing I'll, I'll say uh, and uh, is I, I think we should I think we need to fit it in with a larger agenda a setting uh, for the year. Right, we now have twelve meetings that are non budget, and so I think we just need to look at it really intentionally and see where we're at. I started some of that work based on your earlier memos, but obviously it's getting deferred because we've had other things just sort of come up. So I don't know, that's how, where I see it. I, but if you want to hear from um, Rod on that, let, let me know. Is, is that is that helpful as an answer? Or sure. Answer? Okay. <laughs> so so my, my thinking is, I think we need to see if we have time and capacity for it amongst everything else that we want okay. to do. That makes more sense. Okay. Sorry. Right. I'm not concise. Um, any, any other questions for Rod? I have, I have one, Rod. Um, I know that the reciprocal licensing agreement for the trail has um, 
um, that it was initiated by um, our attorney to the school's uh, SAE70s attorney several months ago. And I know that in re at the most recent meeting, the school indicated that they are eager to seek finalization. Can you um, can you talk a little bit about um, how um, where we are where we are with that and and uh, what you've heard back from council? Um, anything that you would like to say in terms of an update on that would be helpful. Thank you. So yes, the, our um, council provided the council for this um, SAU seventy uh, draft reciprocal license agreement in January early January, January the 10th, and um, we prompted them for a response uh, in the middle of March, and um, we understand that uh, the school, the supervisory union and the school board have worked with their council and um, that that is on its, their, their, their marked up version of the draft agreement is um, where uh, we have not received a copy of it. So um, I've definitely not received a copy of it. And as far as I know, Joe McLean, our council has not received a copy of it. When we do, I'll let you know. Um, I, I understand the school is eager to move forward with various things, but um, we feel that it's important that, that the agreement is at least uh, in discussion before we proceed with anything. Okay, and then finally, just because I want this on the record, quite frankly, um, yeah. we initiated we initiated a motion and that was unanimous in August of last year that sought um, that that uh, authorized you to uh, begin to initiate a, a discussion on a reciprocal license agreement. Sure. And then soon, how soon after did that work begin from our attorney? And then how soon after did their attorney first um, be sent it? We worked with our attorney in the um, October through November timeframe, and then there was a break. You know, there was the typical slowdown between uh, you know around between Thanksgiving and Christmas. It was forwarded to their council January tenth. Okay, and I understand informally that um, there was an oversight on the part of their council, and it was not forwarded to the school for the supervisory union for consideration until early March. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Any other questions on anything else? And then I violated my own rule. We're at 912. So let's go ahead, Marsha. You get the final question. Okay. So this says uh, it's a February 4th report. Is that um, a misstate? That's, that's and, a typo. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and have we advertised the position for zoning administrator? Um, I had a question about whether that was appropriate, even though we've already done it and it's gone to the council. So I'm wondering if that really has been advertised yet and i'd kind of like to hold off hiring somebody until we have the answer from council rod do you want to just uh share uh sort of the initial advice you got from the if you got initial advice before, uh, Did, i have received initial advice i expect to see a, a, a detailed response to masha's uh memo from council soon um in fact joe and i discussed the timing of that today um, the zoning administrative position is advertised uh, in the Valley News uh, on the town web page and has been distributed to uh, the typical list serves and the uh, job description and the position description, the advertisement, makes clear that the select board appoints the, the planning commission, makes a recommendation to the select board and the select board appoints the zoning administrator, which is the way I was... Um, appointed as zoning administrator when I was appointed as zoning administrator for Norwich and is the um, my understanding of the statutory requirements. So that, that series of steps would be followed. The questions that Marsha was asking about the allocation of labor and responsibility for the management of the zoning administrative position specifically are things that are being addressed in the council's response. Okay, that's great. Um, thanks so much, um, Rod, for your answering of our questions in your town manager report. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's let's move on to our next agenda item, our final one, which is an executive session. Um, and I believe there's one motion. And Mary, it looks like you're going to make it for us. 
I move to enter executive session under one VSA, section 313A3, evaluation of public officer or employee to discuss a personnel, uh, a personnel issue and to include the town manager. Okay, is there a second? Okay, made by Mary, seconded by Claudette. Um, you have a question, you have a discussion or question, Marcia? Um, just a friendly amendment. Rather than um, including the town manager at the beginning, could we just um, uh, end to invite the town manager so that we can invite him in when we're ready? I think I think it's a well. Why, why don't we all go in together and then um, and then we could ask Rod to come in and out as needed, and the um, minutes will reflect. Um, reflect these movements. How's that? Yes. Okay. So I'll, I'll say that in the discussion session. So, um, so I'll call the question. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, CATV. Um, uh, CATV says, will possible um, result keep streaming live? Um, yes, it's it's fine to, to I, I think, I don't know if you have, CATV has the ability to sort of pause or what have you. I don't know when we'll, we'll come out, but um, we will. <laughs> so, right, I'm putting, I'm putting you folks in the waiting room.
Recording in progress. Okay. Is there a motion to enter public session? So moved. Okay, is there a second? Second. Made by Mary, seconded by Rob. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Um, I believe we'll have a brief statement and uh, a motion for action. The Norwich Select Board takes seriously the concerns of all town employees, including the town manager, and is committed to ensuring a safe, healthy, and welcoming work environment for all employees. We as a board direct the chair and one other member of the select board to immediately identify and contract with an HR professional to investigate current HR complaints and to assist the town to select, to build a positive work environment. Okay, thank you, Marsha. There is a, a motion embedded in that statement. Is there a, a second to direct me and one other to um, seek HR consulting? Yeah, so I'll second it. Okay, um, made by Marsha, seconded by Mary. In, in the discussion, is there someone who would like to be named to, to support me in this work? Okay. I would be happy to be the second person. Okay, thank you very much, Claudette. Um, with that said, um, uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for reading that. Um, for reading that, Marcia. Um, okay, um, I believe our next motion is an adjourn. Our next agenda item is the adjournment. I move to adjourn. Okay, made by Mary. Okay. Seconded by Marcia. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Hey, see you. All right. I'm waiting for the peepers and for the red wing blackbirds. Yep. The robin. Come to my house. Come to my house. <laughs> just think of it. That you can have, you know, six weeks of spring. You just travel around town. Right? Thank you. Yeah. Mom. When I go down to the village, it's like, wow, the grass is green. Yeah. But Shocking. then we can, we can come back up to your house if we miss the peepers later on. <laughs> okay, good, good, night. Night. Good, good night to the peepers and all of you. All right, good night, good night peeps. Record.